will. I sure will. She, she's just like super excited. Now, she wanted originally Brazil to win, you know, but awesome. Brazil got knocked out very, very soon. And I said, well, now you have to root. You have to root for at least one American team. Okay, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but also uh, Brazil uh, lost the game uh, against Croatia in penalties. That's it was right. a really, it was a really tough game. I I, I saw it, but uh, it's that is football. Uh, football. You, it, you can strike to the to the to the goal, but the, if the ball doesn't get in. It doesn't really go, so it's it's like that. But and you have uh, 90 minutes, and of course it's it's per the the, the the more time. But and then the penalties, and we we suffer uh, last Friday with uh, Netherlands. There was a a, a really battlefield. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's, maybe you can saw it, but. There was uh, it was a really tough game. Uh, we started to win two for zero, and then they uh, pair the score two and two. We go to the more extended time, and then to the penalties, and and then we pass it. So it's three hours of suffering. <laughs> three hours of suffering. <laughs> Yeah, because we, we can't. all that suffering, though, Maxi. I mean, you would, you know, I mean, you're supposed to watch a game for the enjoyment of the sport, right? I mean, of course, of course, but <laughs> but we are we are in the World Cup, so uh, it's I, I can not even imagine. Of course, I'm in my home watching on TV. They are in the another place on the planet, but. I can even imagine that people that travel to there to get the tickets, to get yeah. the places to be. Oh, yeah, all, yeah. All that. A lot of money. And, That's true. Exactly. And, you know, we are the Argentina. We have some struggle with the economy. But anyway, they go there. It, it doesn't matter. Right. For some people. And that's i think some kind of passion and some kind of madness but anyway that's football that's why we <laughs> that's football. love football <laughs> well you know i knew that i would have to talk to you about football today um because uh you know certainly the great win you know and messi uh made a great uh goal but the the other guy uh, and i forget his name yeah yeah, yeah. Made two yeah. goals, so that that's great, you know. So. Yeah, that 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 guy, uh, Julian Alvarez, is uh, we, we call it here the spider because the he spider. catch he catch the ball like a spider in the web, and uh -huh. he started to play in my favorite team here in Argentina in the plate. Oh. Uh -huh. So now is he's playing in I think in in Manchester City, and uh, now it's a really good. Really, really good player, and also he's playing between his kind of brother in the in the team because mm. it's oh really, in, in okay. a, not not brother uh, in blood, but they started in River play playing together and they uh, stand each other how to play. Mm. So wow. that's really really good, and of course well, others in, in global in... World Cup and Star Party. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we have to do some kind of another Zoom meeting to talk about football. <laughs> Even the American. I tried, I also... tried to get Messi on to the show, but you know, no, it, it, it wasn't I, easy. You know. No, so. no. <laughs> I hope maybe one day. You know. One day. <laughs> hmm. I, uh, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm proud to say it. I. Uh, helped uh, uh, a family um, with their issues of uh, a young boy that had gotten leukemia. Mm -hmm. And he went to Spain and uh, was able to get a bone marrow transplant. This whole story went on for a long time. It's still going on now, but uh, the boy got his bone marrow transplant uh, and was cured of leukemia. Uh, but before he got it, Messe 
came to, yeah, I know this boy, uh, came to his hospital uh, room and uh, gave him encouragement. So that was really cool. You know, Messi, uh, some people, they don't like how, how he said, but I, I see it that he's very humble. Even I would the, I would agree with that. Even with the little boys, because uh, I, if you search in social media on YouTube, you can find where uh, are these little boys. Even they mm -hmm. go, go into the field that is is not okay, and mm -hmm. they uh, he signed the the, the, the t-shirts, and uh, if uh, it's a a little boy crying because he wants to see it uh, and the, the yeah. security go it away uh, he calls no no come here I, I want to, to meet I want with. to do this yeah, yeah. That's uh, so great. nobody does that of course you have that security that that's that's their, their job but uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Even that, no, it's good it's a good guy he's a good guy all right, so um, welcome to all of you that are uh, listening in and uh, checking in for the 109th Global Star Party. Uh, this is our final uh, star party of the year. Uh, we'll resume our schedule in 2023, but I wanted to let you know that this is this is where we're at right now. And um, uh, let's get uh, let's kick this thing off. Here we go. <clears throat> Astronomers seem to have revealed a puzzling detail in the way dark matter behaves. They found small, dense concentrations of dark matter that bend and magnify light much more strongly than expected. Dark matter is a mysterious, invisible substance that makes up the bulk of the galaxy. The gravitational pull exerted by dark matter is thought to tie galaxies together throughout the universe. There is so much regular matter and dark matter concentrated in massive galaxy clusters that their gravity magnifies and warps light from distant background objects. We call this effect gravitational lensing. We can map where the dark matter is in galaxy clusters by observing how the light bends. Gravitational lensing distorts the appearance of background galaxies into deformed shapes and elongated arcs. Pictures of lensing galaxy clusters are filled with the smeared images of remote background galaxies. The higher the concentration of dark matter in a galaxy cluster, the more dramatic its light bending power is. Smaller clumps of dark matter associated with individual galaxies in the galaxy cluster create more distortions. In some sense, the galaxy cluster acts as a large lens that has many smaller lenses embedded inside of it. But strangely, astronomers found that three galaxy clusters used in their study had concentrations of dark matter that are so massive that the lensing effects they produce are ten times stronger than originally expected. Hubble's crisp images, coupled with observations from the Very Large Telescope in Chile, helped astronomers produce a more accurate dark matter map. By measuring the lensing distortions, astronomers could trace out the amount and distribution of dark matter. This recent study could signal a gap in our current understanding of the nature of dark matter and its properties. It shows us that there's clearly a missing feature of the real universe that we simply are not capturing in our current theoretical models. With studies like this, astronomers look forward to continuing to pin down the intriguing nature of dark matter to better understand the secrets of our mysterious universe.
hopefully you're pumped. This is the 109th Global Star Party. Thank you all for tuning in and watching our program. As I mentioned earlier, if you were watching, um, this is the last Global Star Party of the year. We'll take a break uh, through the holidays and then we're gonna come back in January with a whole new series of Global Star Parties. Uh, we have a incredible lineup of uh, speakers um, and uh, we will be introducing uh, uh, many people that, uh, uh, that have not been on Global Star Party at all, and, and some of them that uh, haven't been on for a while. So uh, it's it's great to uh, <laughs> it's great to have you on. Of course, the theme of this particular Global Star Party is gravitation. And Harold Locke, watching on YouTube, says this is a heavy topic. Scott, I can't argue. Okay, <laughs> so. <laughs> Anyways, I, I do want to thank all of you who have watched and shared and, uh, um, you know, uh, told your friends about um, uh, Global Star Party. Uh, since we started Global Star Party, uh, we have, this uh, obviously is our 109th episode. Um, we, uh, um, you know, we've been able to successfully bring this uh, star party experience to people that were in lockdown over COVID. Um, we learned over the years, of course, over the last couple of years, how many people were uh, unable to go to uh, star parties that other amateur astronomers go to, um, you know, because of various reasons, whether they were taking care of a parent at home or they were just unable to get out or they were too remote. Uh, that kind of thing, and uh, the program's been seen around the world. So it's been a real honor to share uh, this time and this space with um, with all the people who regularly contribute to Global Star Party, and um, uh, you know to uh, to you know to be on with all of you in the audience. Some of you in the audience have actually participated in Global Star Party as well, and so that makes it just doubly cool, I think. Um, but uh, I will get started uh, with my dear friend, uh, David Levy, who, uh, uh, who will give us words of wisdom and uh, uh, will share uh, poetry with us, as he always does on Global Star Party. David, thanks very much. Thanks well, again. Well, thank you, Scott, and uh, welcome everybody to the, um, to the 109th Global Star Party. And uh, after that, we'll have to hold our breaths till early 2023. Please, God, let that be a better year for me than this last one was. But um, before I do my quotation, I'd like to say that two of us here have come up with, um, with books for children. And since this is the holiday time, it's time to buy books for children. David Eicher and Mike Bokic have come up with a book Child's introduction to space travel and going to the moon and going into orbit and going into space, leaving the planet. And uh, and then, as Adrian is doing so beautifully there, showing a copy of the book that I have done called uh, Clipper Cosmos and Children, Finding the Eureka Moment. Here is the uh, cover of the book. And Scott, I sent a picture of it to you yesterday or the day before. Oh, good. good. And um, anyway, it uh, has original art by Wendy's sister, Joan Ellen Rosenthal. And uh, it's we got the idea to do this book when when I walked into uh, the um, study one day, and there was Wendy reading the original Clipper which I had written when I was 10 years old. And uh, I looked at her and she really barely looked up. She knew I was coming in and she said, this is adorable. This is the best book you've ever written. I said, that's the first book I ever wrote. And she says, yeah, and all the other books went downhill from there. But anyway, she said that I wanted to write a second edition of Clipper and put some astronomy into it. And so I called David Eicher and he said, I don't know of any way you can get a dog into astronomy. And uh, so that took care of that one. But anyway, after several years, the book is here. If you'd like to order it, 
It's not yet on Amazonian Amazon, but it is available from this email address, Ron J. Kramer, R-O-N-J-K-R-A-M-E-R, ronjkramer at gmail.com. Cost $20 plus a little bit for shipping and uh, uh, or you can wait till uh, till I get to your town and do a book signing, but I don't know when that's going to be. For my quotation tonight, it's not really going to be a poem, but we're talking about gravitation. And Mr. Gravitation himself was Albert Einstein. And he came up in 1905 with the special theory of relativity. And uh, then he came out in 1917 with the general theory of relativity. And um, uh, he was really looking for ways to, uh, to show that it really worked, that his new theory of gravitation worked. There was the eclipse of the sun. And uh, then there was before that uh, evidence that uh, the planet Mercury had um, the perihelion precession of Mercury's orbit could be explained through general relativity. When he realized and understood that, I mean, he was as excited as he's ever been in his entire life. So my quote is two sentences from Abraham Pais's beautiful biography, Subtle is the Lord. And on Einstein's discovery, that the perihelion precession of Mercury's orbit could be explained through general relativity. Hayes wrote, this discovery was, I believe, by far the strongest emotional experience in Einstein's scientific life, perhaps in all his life. Next sentence is, nature had spoken to him. Thank you, Scott, and back to you. Thank you very much, David. That's great. Okay, so um, we will uh, uh, come back to um, more astronomy here in a second, but I do want to talk a little bit about um, the people that are going to be on uh, this program tonight, aside from David. Um, and uh, David, I, again, I want to thank you for being on all these programs. You've done a monumental job, but I also want to take my hat off to you for all the other live streams that you've done all the other meetings that you've attended. Uh, there's, a, I don't know of anyone more dedicated to this kind of thing than, than you are uh, with all the stuff that you do. I, I would believe that you probably do four or five uh, uh, such um, uh, live streams for various clubs and stuff like that probably every week, you know, so it's just, uh, it's really amazing and um, you know, uh, the whole community owes a huge thank you. Um, thank you so much, Scotty. Um, I have to say that uh, officially, I know nothing about astronomy. I am a total doofus when it comes to astronomy. Yeah, I've never right. taken a course in astronomy. But if I could wave my hat just a little bit, I do not know of anyone in the world who is more passionate about observing the night sky with eye and with a telescope as I am. I've tried to find people, but I can't yet. And well, I'd like to find someone who is more so than I. Anyway, back to you, Scott, and thank well, you. Well, you know what, David? I'm <laughs> going to throw a name out there, and if this gentleman ever watches um, from the University of Lowbrow Astronomers, a gentleman named Jim Forrester, um, I may introduce you to him someday because... He's passionate about visual astronomy, and um, he and his friend Nathan Murphy that I go to Okitex with every year, um, anyone turns on any light, faint or whatever, <laughs> they're on them like a hawk. Turn that light off. Turn that light and, out. They, you know, the, the cry of the visual astronomer trying to night adapt. Turn that light off. So I'll let him know. I just, I told him. I told them to you um, some visual astronomers. Some of the some of the old time clubs are long visual astronomers, and they they would go out with you in a heartbeat. No cameras, none of these flashlights. They they want to see the night sky with their eyes and the big old thirty inch 
telescopes it. and that's that's how they operate so there are some we just have to they're they're scattered about um all over the globe okay all right so let's um let's talk a little bit about our uh speakers tonight uh uh, representing the Astronomical League will be John Goss. Uh, John uh, has been with the league for many, many years. Uh, you know, I have a tough time remembering being around the Astronomical League and John not being there. Uh, he's also a past president, so we're very honored to have him on tonight. Um, David Eicher, also just incredible uh, contributions uh, to amateur astronomy. Uh, He's often here on Global Star Party. Um, uh, we got to learn about his universe of minerals and crystals, and uh, we got to learn um, about uh, uh, many aspects, uh, galaxies, and now we're into his exotic deep sky objects. So we're really having a great time with David being on this program, uh, you know, and uh, he is, uh, he's also heading up uh, you know, what is considered to be, you know, maybe the pinnacle of astronomy outreach programs, which is the Starmus event. And uh, so it was a real honor to be out with him in Yerevan this year. Uh, Maxi Falaris uh, is the can-do astrophotographer. Uh, when we first met Maxi, uh, he had told me he'd torn apart a smartphone uh, tore off the lens and just use the sensor to make his astrophotos, you know. So this is a guy that made uh, stunning deep sky astrophotography and planetary photography with the most modest of equipment. So uh, there, there should be an Oscar for people like that. And uh, Maxi certainly deserves one. He'll be on. Adrian Bradley has, uh, has evolved through this program and has learned about the night sky through his uh, nightscapes. And he's introducing a new name for his program called Chasing Dark Skies. Uh, Nicholas Arias, uh, again, another guy who uh, uses modest equipment, um, showed us how to make uh, deep sky images using a Dobsonian with no drives. Okay, if you can imagine that. Don Davies, who's from uh, Texas, uh, has been to many a Texas star party, also very involved in astronomy outreach, has now gone to Chile, and she's going to broadcast live from one of the giant observatories at CTIO. So I'm really excited to, you know, hopefully that all comes off okay, but uh, she says it will, so uh, I believe her. So, and then we'll take a little break, and then we're going to come back with Fraser Kane from Universe Today. Uh, if you haven't been to universetoday.com, you definitely need to go there and subscribe to uh, that uh, news uh, outlet, which is really fantastic. Uh, Marcelo Souza uh, from Brazil, uh, also another giant uh, in the Americas for astronomy outreach, uh, is about to uh, conduct the 15th IMAA event, which attracts hundreds or thousands of people. Uh, really fantastic. Cesar Brolo from Optus, Optica Sirocco uh, is going to be sharing uh, his uh, passion for southern skies. And then we'll have a, you know, this is the 50th, this is the end of the 50th anniversary of the Apollo missions. And we're currently in uh, what was 50 years ago, uh, you know, in the Apollo 17 uh, mission itself. And so we've got a couple of very nice videos about that. Um, uh, and then Frank Marches is a, a SETI astronomer and uh, he is a, a Unistellar's co-founder. This is a telescope uh, that, um, uh, you know, is largely automatic uh, and will find objects for you, but it makes images. It's really a slick device. And I'm proud to say that Explore Scientific is now uh, the U.S. distributor for uh, for this uh, this product, actually the distributor for the Americas as well. So, anyways, uh, we've got um, a great lineup, and we're going next to John Goss from the Astronomical League, which has grown leaps and bounds through uh, the COVID uh, experience, and um, uh, and now they are they're getting ready for their next Alcon event. 
uh, which will happen down in, in Louisiana. And this Friday, they're going to have their next Astronomical League live. Here we go, John. Oh, thank, thank you. Hey, John. it's Santa Claus. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, you'll see what I'm talking about here in a, in a minute or two. Um, but yeah, uh, thank, thank you for that introduction. And Alcon is coming up, and I see Mr. Eicher is up there on our screen right there. And I, I think he's supposed to be there if, if things work out. Okay, great. Great. And uh, it, it, it'll be a good time. It'll be in uh, Baton Rouge in Baton Rouge in July. Now, I won't go, I won't say everything that people have told me about this, but uh, it'll be an inter interesting event. I, I was born not too far from there in July, so I, I know what it's like. But anyway, uh, enough, enough of this. I'd like, to, I'd like to jump in something here and see what I can get going. Um, da -da 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 hmm. Let's see what I can do. Yes. Okay. Uh, this Friday, uh, in two days from now, we'll have the next Astronomical League live event with Bob King, and he'll be talking a lot about um, the, the uh, current solar cycle and the upcoming solar, solar max. I think it's going to be pretty exciting, uh, interesting talk. I, I've been looking at the sun a lot lately, too, right now, over the past uh, eight weeks, because I'm working on the Astronomical League Hydrogen Alpha program and that requires an, a bunch of observing the sun with a special hydrogen alpha scope but this uh, friday night uh, bob king will be on there talking about it and you'll be able to meet some of the officers of the astronomical league and see what what it's all about let's start out by again talking about the um, um, solar programs and how important it is to make sure if you do look at the sun to have the correct uh, proper safe uh, filters placed on the front part of your telescope over the aperture. Um, you know, the sun is pretty darn bright. People don't don't really think about how bright the sun is. They think, oh, the, the moon, full moon's pretty bright, and the, and the sun's just a bunch, bunch of times brighter. You know, well, yeah, well, yeah, but this, the sun is like 400,000 times brighter than the full moon. So, you know, you can imagine if you look at it through a telescope that's not properly filtered, it would just take a split second to do permanent damage to your eyes. I, I, I feel like a parent every, every other week when I, when, I, when I say this, but it's all true. <laughs> okay, what we like to do, the reason why I'm here is because we, um, we offer three questions in every meeting uh, for the chance to win a door prize. And right now, I'd like to discuss, reveal last meeting's answers, which was from June, or June, <laughs> December 6th. First question. Uh, who discovered the four main moons of Jupiter in 1610? Well, I think a lot of us know it's just, I think they're called the Galilean moons for a reason. And the uh, answer is uh, Mr. Galileo himself. Uh, second question. Which star is closest to the sun? Um, you know, I suppose you could say a few things on this, but I, I think the actual distance winner is uh, Proxima Centauri. A little, little over four, four, four light years away. Then you got Alpha Centauri and, and its companion as well after that. Number three. Last year, I think it was last year, or maybe it was the year before, you know, with all this, this COVID stuff and not meeting, I, I lose track of time pretty easily. But I think last year was the first year the Astronomical League offered a, a new observing award. And that was uh, um, mainly direct or directed towards adult women. And it's called the... Uh, um, the Williamina Fleming Imaging Award. So, yeah, you might want to look into that and see what that offers for you. Correct answers from last uh, last last star party: John Williams, Josh uh, Kovacs, uh, Andrew Corhill, Daniel Higgins, and Rich Kraling. So, thank thank you all for for participating in that. And we'd like to see uh, some 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 new names on there because I do recognize a few of those those names on there already. Questions for this week. Do things differently. Scott doesn't know this, <laughs> but I, I, I like surprises. I, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's a, it's a, it's kind of an interesting surprise here. But we're going to do three questions again, and if you know the answers, uh, write them down and send them to secretary at astroleague.org. Oh, um, so be sure to do that, secretary at astroleague.org. So we're going to start here in just a moment. 
Uh, I guess I can go to the next slide. Okay. We're going to do a little poem. Cool. And this, and this was something that Genevieve and I put together a number of years ago. We've been making changes as time, time goes on to it, but I'd like to, to do something with that right now uh, called the Night of the Solstice. You can kind of imagine how this is going to go. But uh, we're going to have three questions embedded in this, and I want you all to pay attention because to get the answers right, you got to pay attention. <laughs> so let's cool. start. Yeah. Oh, before I start, I'm sorry. I have been accused when I start reading this, I sound like Bullwinkle Moose. So hmm. I'll try not. I'll try not to do. That. Really? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm gonna try not. I love Bullwinkle. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, <laughs> hey, Rocky. Yeah, it was the night of the solstice, <laughs> but I'll, I'll try to do. It. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to be serious. Uh, uh, I see oh, you all oh. laughing. I see you all laughing. Okay, here we go. The night of the, the night of the solstice. It was the night of the solstice, and all through the town, stargazers kept looking up, none wearing a frown. Their stockings were hung by the chimneys with care, in hopes that new telescopes soon would be there. Their families were nestled at home in warm beds, while visions of star-filled skies danced in their heads. My friend in a parka and I in my wool cap knew an observing sight not shown on any map. Hmm. In the trunk of my car, we made such a clatter of loading telescopes and technical chatter. Away to darker skies, we flew like a flash. Avoiding small animals, we made our mad dash. Pay attention now. Pay attention to what I'm saying. A moon low in the east shone two days till new, and the crisp bright air gave us no hint of dew. But what in our finer scope should clearly appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. I think this is all based on a true story too. <laughs> Question one. You have this scene and I'm not, I'm not gonna describe it too closely because you should look at it. So why is this scene incorrect? Is it A, the moon should not be full, but a wanting crescent instead? B, a reindeer is missing. C, it is simply silly to think that Santa is authorized to pilot the ISS as a sleigh. Now, one of those is clearly correct. The, the others, uh, okay. So remember, write this down. Let's continue. It carried a driver so lively and jolly. We thought for a moment, this was your fault. More rapid the Geminids, his reindeer they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Draco, now Virgo, now Ligo, and Taurus, on Lyra, on Hydra, on Libra, and Corvus. To the top of the hill they followed us call, now dash away, dash away, dash away all. Ho, ho, ho. Awesome. Guided by a red light, they passes over high, while Sirius was shining far south in the sky. So onto the hilltop the reindeer they flew, with a sleigh full of gadgets and eyepieces too. Okay, question two. Hope you've been paying attention. If you have been good, and I mean really good this year, Santa brought a low power wide field super eyepiece. Of these three choices, what was its most likely focal length? Remember, low power wide field super eyepiece. And remember, only if you've been very, very good. A, a 10 millimeter Huygens, a 4.5 millimeter orthoscopic with a two power Barlow, or a 25 millimeter nitrogen purge waterproof super duper fully coated eyepiece. So which of those three babies would this be? Remember, you have to be very good. So let's move on. Let's see if we can find question three. And with purpose of mind, he jumped to the ground then checked in the sleigh to see what could be found. Out of his black bag came a very big daub and setting it up was a very big job. Decked out in full fur from his head to his toe, he looked straight down his scope and aligned it just so. Wearing a red hat, black boots and one white glove, he then peered up to see what was shining above. A bundle of worn charts he flung on his back. He looked like a peddler just opening his pack. Uh, then went to the scope with a list in his hand to us from William, William Herschel, toughest of the land. Question three, final question. But it's not the end here. 
Just final question. Which Astronomical League observing program was Santa working on? You know, he is an honorary member. A, carbon stars. B, lunar, or lunar two. C, Herschel 400, or possibly the Herschel two. One of those three. Santa's a busy guy too. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work, then turned with a jerk. And raising his bare thumb, he gave us a sign, letting us, letting us know that the seeing was fine. His gear was all loaded with a wink of an eye, and he sprang to the sleigh and flew off in the sky. But we heard him exclaim as he drove out of sight, happy viewing to all, and to all a clear night. So you got your three questions. <laughs> Wonderful. You had to pay attention to get the answers. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. That is awesome. Thank you so much, John. Well, one final note. See, the question is, do, is, is not, do I believe in Santa? But it is, does Santa believe in me? Now let's talk about those why field eye pieces. <laughs> okay. That's what I got. Wonderful. Thank you all for putting it up with that. <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful. Nowhere else but Global Star Party. So this is great. This is great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, well, it's, uh, it is time. I wish I had a drum roll, and I normally do have a drum roll. But instead, I'm going to turn, uh, turn, turn it over to a drummer, and that is Mr. David Eicher from Astronomy Magazine. He's here with us tonight. Thank you for coming on, David. Thank you very much. You know what's nice about being a drummer? You get to hang around with musicians. Yes, you do. <laughs> you know what you do if you see a drummer on your porch? No. Pay for the pizza. <laughs> there, there are a lot of drummer jokes. I won't go into any more. But uh, I will share my screen and share another interesting object um, in surveying the sky. And I'm hoping you can see the right thing there. And we've yes, got we can. We're not talking about Cygnus X1 once again, but I'll jump right ahead to remember our old friend, George Abel, who uh, at, at UCLA, who was a great extragalactic astronomer. And in 1958, he compiled one of his famous lists, the Abel cluster catalog of galaxy clusters. He also did a lot of work on planetary nebulae as well. It was extended by Abel and collaborators later on, and eventually it contained uh, more than 4,000 uh, clusters of galaxies. So a lot of these, of course, because bright clusters of galaxies were known uh, much earlier for the most part, of course, a lot of these are very faint and they're somewhat distant. So now we're kind of working our way down from the vicinity of the North, Galact of the, of the North Celestial Pole here and we come to Abel 2256, which is an interesting cluster. Uh, it's a rich group of galaxies lying in Ursa Minor. There are more than 500 galaxies in this cluster and it's about 800 million light years away. So it's moderately distant, but not nearly as distant as a lot of uh, galaxy clusters that are now known, of course. It's about 10 million light years across, so it's about the same diameter as our local group of galaxies, uh, which contains uh, about 55 galaxies and maybe as many as 100, our local group, because mm -hmm. we don't, uh, we can't, maybe can't see all of the dwarfs that outnumber other types, of course, in a galaxy cluster. So you can see how rich this is. It, it contains from five to 10 times as many galaxies as we have in our little uh, group, the local group of galaxies, as Edwin Hubble named it so cleverly. So this is a galaxy cluster that is a challenge. If you want, you know, if you're tired of shooting the Orion Nebula for the 312th time, th there are a lot of objects out there like the like this Abel cluster uh, that you can go after. Um, and it's a bit of a challenge because the brightest galaxy in this cluster uh, is a magnitude 15.4. Wow. Object. And the second brightest member is UGC uh, 10726. 
which is considerably fainter as well. Overall, the cl cluster uh, spans uh, um, about 140 arc minutes, so it's fairly large on the sky, uh, but most of those galaxies are, are within a fairly condensed central core, as is the case with a lot of such galaxy clusters. This one has been studied a good bit in the X-ray part of the spectrum by Chandra and, and a number of other instruments like XMM. And it's notable because it has three X-ray emitting subclusters, which is not unusual for a, a cluster like this. Aside from the main cluster, there's a remnant of an older merger um, within this cluster and also a brighter bullet-like system of infalling gas that is somewhat puzzling to astronomers and is currently the subject of some research going on with some groups. So I've begun, <clears throat> excuse me, I've begun to lift a few of these wonderful um, little pieces of star maps that you can see from uh, Ron Stoy, one of the nicest recent star maps, star atlases that is out there that's not enormously huge, uh, but it's incredibly detailed, um, is this really, really wonderful interstellarum deep sky atlas uh, that was published in 2015 by Ron Stoy in, in Germany. And it, it's just a real treasure, uh, aside from a couple of others, the Millennium Star Atlas and the Great Star Atlas, which are even larger and more detailed. But this one is really fairly compact and is fantastically loaded with, you know, obscure deep sky objects. So I would recommend getting your hands on this atlas if you can, but here you can see the Abel 2256 and how large it is, and, and there are a number of other interesting uh, deep sky objects in the region here. NGC 6217 is the brightest one in the area here of Ursa Minor, which is probably not necessarily a region of the sky that you're looking at a whole lot, but there's some interesting stuff here. Um, and to jump ahead, our pal in Austria, Bernhard Hubel, um, here's his shot of the sort of the central part, and this is the majority of Abel 2256, and you can see the two brightest, uh, which are CD galaxies in the center of the cluster there, the two that I mentioned, and then a lot of fainter galaxies around it. Many of the things in this field are, are galaxies, aside from the bright Milky Way foreground stars, of course, that have diffraction spikes. So that you can see there are a lot of galaxies in this field, even in a relatively deep amateur astro image of the field. There's also this finder chart that is out there on the internet for Abel 2256. Uh, this is by Menno Jansen, uh, who is a Dutch astro imager. And can you imagine the time to go in there and label all these galaxies? Wow. Holy cow, that are in the central core of Abel 2256. So this is just really a, a suggestion if you've never looked at this, if you have a large telescope or imaged it, if you have a moderate or large telescope, it's an interesting one of many dozens of interesting galaxy clusters that nobody really ever looks at or takes images of, very few people. Um, and you can see how many galaxies are in this field of a couple of degrees across. It's a very rich but overlooked cluster. So that's another suggestion of a weird and somewhat exotic deep sky object. And again, I want to pay, he, I think he left us here for the evening already, but I'll pay uh, homage again to Dr. David Levy. Uh, for writing the introduction to the first issue of our uh, 50th anniversary year is everything you want to know about comets. And David wrote a very nice introductory two-page spread to this issue that's out there now that talks about uh, all the major aspects about comets, which we also like to observe uh, from time to time as well. And thanks to David for mentioning our book, Michael's book and my book on, on a child's introduction to space exploration, which is out there as well from Black Dog and Leventhal publishers. So that's it, Scott, from me tonight. Uh, another Thank tip you. of the hat to an unusual kind of object and, and a, you know, heads up that there are many, many faint and interesting galaxy clusters out there that basically nobody's looking at. So there's yeah. a challenge to the astro imagers. That's right. That's right. And it would be really cool to start to see a bunch of astrophotographers take on that challenge and um, 
learn how to uh, yeah, well a lot of a lot of them already know how to shoot deep you know it's just uh, you know going after something that's a little bit more unusual and it would just be great to see it grace the pages of astronomy magazine so it will be a challenge because there are a lot of astrophotographers who gather their data under what they say are Bortle 7 skies. Their skies may be actually worse if they were to pull this meter out. Yes. But that intimidates them from going after 15th magnitude objects. But we know that the key to astrophotography isn't necessarily uh, your sky quality so much as time. We get when you bring on Jason Gwenzel or some of the other top astrophotographers, Gary Palmer, and the ones that you know, um, David. I almost called you David. There's only one David. <laughs> You're David. That, that, that's okay. And, and you can include yourself, Adrian, in that class of of really good astro imagers too. By the way, that's I right. appreciate that. I, like I said, I, I keep not sending you data, and I got to send it to you. But um, the key is what we all know is that it's time that matters, not so much your sky. And you, you need a clear sky, but you have to accumulate this data over time, and that's when all of these smaller things show up. And you know what we have, or you know what we do as astrophotographers, we kind of constantly shoot some of the same things because we see results after a couple of hours so we keep going sure. this is something yep. you this is something we're not going to see much result until we get to that 30th hour and then they're going to start showing up so so hopefully uh other astrophotographers on the um you know they're watching challenge accepted and you know i really like the series that you're putting on it's um i try to take note send it to a few folks uh the visual astronomers try to go after it in dark skies so um i would sent the last one and there were there were some uh discussion over it so it's uh so it's great <laughs> definitely keep going um i appreciate it and i know everyone watching um appreciates these little gems that you're that you're sharing with us well, thanks, Adrian, and thanks for the good words and, and keep up the great astro imaging work. And, and some of these will be not nearly as challenging as, you know, the brightest thing in the scene is 15th magnitude either. But you, you may like this or you may be horrified by it, but I've put together a list of things to think about that are unusual and a little mm -hmm. exotic this way that right now at the moment amounts to 424 objects which I can share one one after the other. So th this may be a good thing, or Scott may think, oh, God almighty. You know. um, no, so Scott, you, Scott, you know what you hey, do? Hey, I'm down it. for it, dude. You're going to catalog it and call it the Iker 424. <laughs> hey, you're going to put a book out. You guys put a book, and we're going to call it the Iker 424. The mind-numbing, you know, travel. The <laughs> yeah, that's harder than her. The Iker 424. Uh-oh, I, I better get to, go. I better get to work. Saying, yeah, I'll go after one of those you just, as long as it's in the Southern Hemisphere. Well, at least it wasn't the NGC, right? Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Okay, so up next, folks, is Maxi Filares. Uh, Maxi, uh, we're really happy to have you on the program. It's been a little while uh, since you've been on, but, uh, uh, you know, and we know that you're jumping up and down with excitement because Argentina won uh the uh fifa uh event today and uh uh so you know i can imagine that there's a lot of partying going on in argentina right now yeah the, the, the jersey <laughs> you wore the jersey <laughs> he's a player he's he's actually on the team <laughs> yeah I, I i support him from here but i don't play <laughs> football anymore i i can't do it uh but uh, i'm so i'm still supporting my team and of course, it was a really, really good game today. Uh, it, it, Croatia was a, a, a really tough rival, but that's that's a, a, the game that you have to do to to win to win. So now we are going to uh, see if we go against uh, Morocco or France. So uh, France is really tough. We lost in the last uh, World Cup, they kick out, out us uh, in the eighth final. But, well, 
anyway, so I'm supporting here my team with my t-shirt of uh, the Argentina selection. So, but anyway, I don't want to talk uh, too much about football tonight. Uh, I want to, to share what I've been doing in these couple of days. Uh, but first of all, I I like to share. Uh, sorry. Let me put this and these pictures. Well, um, sorry. I I don't know if you see this picture, this this screen. Uh, I want yes. to start to to well in this past uh, two weekends, I lost some of my really good, really good friends. Uh, I lost uh, two dogs from, from in in my home. Uh, they die by natural cause. One and the another one. It was really tough because we didn't we couldn't save him at time. Uh, but always I will remember them. Uh, support me to doing astrophoto in my backyard. She was the the guardian of the telescope because she every time I grab my equipment outside, she was there sleeping and doing company with me. And also uh, she was she calls uh, Luna like moon in English and. She passed away last Sunday, so for me it's really tough. And the last week, weekend, uh, 80 days ago, I lost this uh, particular friend. He was called Black uh, Onegro uh, because he he has a uh, dark hair on his body, but he always. Uh, was with me every time that I do pictures. This is a picture of him. So I I want to to take these minutes to get memory for them because they were really really good friends in my life. So okay. Anyway, uh, I was doing some pictures and planetary pictures in this couple of days. We have a meeting also in the Parque Silos del Sur or the Southern uh, Sky Park in Chivicoy a couple of days ago. Uh, so I want to talk about this particular landscape that we did some with some friends. We went uh, almost uh, 40 miles, uh, 40 kilometers from the south. Uh, Maxi, I think the screen you're sharing these wonderful pictures ah. on. May oh, not. sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry, my bad. Uh, yeah, we're just seeing uh, your. Yeah, we were. Thumbnails. Your window. Yeah, we're just getting. Your Here we go again. <clears throat> okay, so. Yeah, if you want, if you want to really quickly bring up your two companions one more time because oh sorry see them no sorry. yeah let, we'll get a better let's get a better look yeah. of them and then he, yeah so he, this he was, was black he was yes. really really fun guy uh yeah. you know you can see in his face he always mm -hmm. wants to give you love he wants to be with you asking love in your leg every time mm -hmm. and okay he he passed away uh, days 10 days ago and we could couldn't save him. I was in the veteran and in the doctor, and we are going to do some surgery, but we couldn't make it because he he passed away. And the the another person, the another dog for me is a person uh, because he was part of the, my family. He was a uh, she. She was Luna. She was the the guardian of the telescope. Because every time I grab my equipment outside in my backyard, she was there to doing companion. Even if I don't be there, I go inside. She was there. She was sleeping always there. You can see. Yeah. And and also, well, 
Uh, she calls Luna like the moon uh, in Spanish. And she passed away. Uh, she has 13 years. Uh, unfortunately, she was really sick. And the, the last Sunday, she doesn't give too much. So she passed away. So this is my little humble to, to honor them. Yeah, because it was really, really good friends in my life. So well, uh, continuing with the GSP. Sorry uh, if I get emotional. Um, it's okay. That's why I wanted I, you to do it again because we wanted to make sure we gave your your companions their time. So. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, Adrian. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. Uh, well, uh, days before this things uh, i went with my friend ariel rodriguez he's in the middle i'm here sitting in this little chair so we could do uh, this uh, selfie that he puts his camera and still waiting for 13 seconds only at iso i think 12,000. and you can see here behind of us is the city of chivilcoy and this blob here is the the well, uh, Buenos Aires and Great Buenos Aires and other cities. But you can see here, here are the Pleiades, uh, Mars, and Orion, Belt, Betelgeuse, Rigel, and M42. And it was a really good night. It, it, doesn't, it wasn't a cold night. Uh, this is pointing to the south. Uh, this is the city of 25 de Mayo, 25 of May. Uh, this is Aladillo. But uh, we are been doing observationally and taking pictures with another cameras. You can see Himi a little movement, but you can see some satellites crossing over the sky. And, you know, uh, here's another one. There's a lot. And, and I think it was... Uh, 2 a.m. At, at that time, so uh, we 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 get a really good night to to do some pictures. So I did. Uh, I pointed to to many places to to see with my equipment what I can do. So I put a couple pictures to uh, the Tarantula Nebula in the uh, gray Magellanic cloud. And you can see here's the Tarantula Nebula and the rest of the nebulosity and star clusters there. Really, there's a lot. There's a really good places to, to capture it. And also, I've been doing uh, this object. Let me stretch the screen uh, here. This is the, the, witch, the witch face, like we call it. Uh, this is the regional star in Orion, and you can see that. Oh yeah, the 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 face of the witch. Yes, the eye, the nose, the mouth, and the laughing. The, yeah, the looks beard. Like laughing at the sky. Yeah, she was laughing. <laughs> so also, I've been doing this object because I have it in almost four hours maybe three but i have the the light pollution of chivilcoy because it's really low at the north maybe you can recognize this oh yeah this is the uh, andromeda galaxy and i was i i i really like the the picture and the and the field of view but I have some gradients. I think I wasn't really good with the focus. But anyway, I, like I say, I was practicing with this little equipment to do some astrophoto very light to outside and, and see how the field of view was. And the uh, another object that I was capturing, it was M45, the Pleiades. Let me put it more, yeah. 
I think it was almost one hour taking pictures to this place. Wow, uh, nice. I had to process this, but I didn't like too much the the background. You know, when you do astrophotography, <clears throat> you start to do, you start to be more precisely. And when you don't like something, you say, no, okay, it doesn't, you, you, you trash it. <laughs> it's a shame, but uh, it's, I, I wasn't like this before, but, um, no. But now I, I'm getting now more... that now that you're good. <laughs> I, I'm trying to be good, but that's what you make you good, I think. But <laughs> I, I progress a lot, but I had to progress too much in my mm. so what I've been doing also was planetary pictures uh, at the end of uh, November. I did this picture of Jupiter. I I have a really good night to do a, well, a take him, I, I saw there was the great red spot there. So I did almost, I think Very maybe nice. 40 minutes of videos to derotate them. And I have this result. Also, I pointed to Mars because it was almost in a position. And you can see it, this is the North Pole. We have Certis Majoris place. Uh, I think it was uh, Elas Planitia, this place column. Uh, and I don't remember this area today. Uh, so a couple of days before, more later, I pointed to the to Mars again at the same time, uh, same hour, I mean. And you can see the this part is oh, that's cool. It's more uh, um, back maybe uh, more more later to be there again so that's how we call we, we have the different hours uh, uh, with Mars in the in our days right, right. Um, also well I did I like I say we met in the uh, southern um, Sky Park with Armando Sandanel to do some uh, astronomy reach with everyone that wants to go to see the sky, to see the planet, see the moon. And it was a really good night because uh, we started with almost 36, 37 Celsius degrees with heat. So it was a really tough afternoon. Maybe it will be almost uh 65 fahrenheit degrees nice uh, very so nice it, it was very warm <laughs> so uh, i pointed to in this case to the to the sun with a solar filter uh, i get this picture that i was practicing to 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 go uh, share with uh, with the social media uh, and remember that to everyone to come with us uh we have this is the a screenshot from the space weather live you can see the the sunspots here's the same field of view that is inverted and well here's uh, armando sandale he was preparing his uh, refractor um so the that night was really good because what well, this is on focus because i i send this picture to a friend but they came to many people they saw the um, the um, the moon they for the first time uh, also jupiter also saturn so they went uh, with a happy face to their home and also i say okay if you want to wait you can take pictures of the moon to 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 show uh, with your friends and save it to you, that's not, no problem. So they were really, really, really happy. And to the good news that I want to share uh, also, it was uh, in the um, a, a couple of days ago, I re um, I received this a particular magazine. It called Simove. Uh, mm because uh, it was the uh, Epersimove was the, 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 the 
the, the say of Galileo Galilei said eh, to, the, to the church. Eh, sin embargo, se mueve. Eh, this is the, um, a, a divulgation magazine that, a, a scientific divulgation magazine that it was um, redacted by the Galileo Galilei Planetary in the city of Buenos Aires. And I'm glad to uh, uh, participate with them because I, I sent them a, a picture that I did a couple months ago because they want to do some uh, articulary uh, of, uh, um, of the uh, sculptural um, uh, um, constellation. So they also put pictures of everyone that want to share it and do some articles. And in the page 38, you can see, well, there's a lot of pictures and this is uh, my pictures that I took in Alberti. And they sent me uh, a couple of days ago. I don't know if you can see me. Uh, I, now I, I'm going to share the, the link if you want to watch it. it. Of course, it is in Spanish. And also it's a free magazine that you can see it. But I have my printed... Uh, magazine let me stop the blur to cover the background this is c mover and in the page 38 we have oh. you know to see it to see this in paper uh it's like it comes comes to to live you know and i'm i'm even of, of these days, it was um, a smile to my soul to to see this. Uh, even what what was happened this couple of days ago. So, well, uh, I think this was everything. Um, uh, I don't remember if I. No, I think not. Well, ah, uh, it's some something to say only. That night that we that we went to the to the park, it came. Uh, I have a little visitor. It was my. I I felt someone was uh, touching my leg to to call on me, and then when I goes to see it, it was my nephew, uh, of three years old. He was oh tío, uncle, uncle, and I'm really glad because he uh, it. Even that he has three years old only, he it was the first time that he saw the moon through a telescope because he always say, "Oh look, it, it's the moon, the moon, the moon," and uh, then when he saw it through a telescope, he was really really happy, and I'm and I'm glad to be there for that moment. So, uh, well, some something to to say. Uh, it's okay. That I think that's it. That's all for today. Uh, I'm glad to be here and I hope you to have a really good uh, holidays, uh, be with your family, with your friends and a really good, happy new year. Uh, and I hope that Argentina wins the World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's who I shall root yeah. for as well. That's Thanks. right. Well, everybody in the Americas is rooting for you, so. That's right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyhow, uh, all in good fun. Um, so, uh, thanks again, Maxie, uh, for coming on and sharing your great work with us. And uh, uh, next up is Adrian Bradley, uh, who's uh, who has morphed uh, into uh, doing some extremely fine. Uh, uh, nightscape photography uh, over the years and uh, a couple of those years have been with us and so we're really happy to have Adrian on in his um, new segment called Chasing Dark Skies. So I'll turn it over to you Adrian. Thank you man. All right. Yep. As you hear my voice interrupting and commenting on all of the uh, other um, presentations so um, 
you know, I do love being a part of this, uh, Scott and Maxi, you know, Maxi, little quick story. Maxi came um, for um, astronomy at the beach, which is one of the things that we do in Michigan every year. Um, I called on Maxi and said, hey, we could use a presentation on the southern skies. And Maxi came and gave a presentation and we thought it was very informative and it was just nice seeing you then when you came out there. Um, later on throughout the next year, Scott, I think I'm going to, I'll start plugging some of the, the uh, astronomy at the beach star party that we do in Michigan Very of cool. the global audience that's watching those that are in the States and those that are near Michigan. Um, I think it'll be worth it to share. Um, we've gotten back to an in-person, like, you know, other star parties, we've gotten back to an in-person event um, doing astronomy at the beach. So a few of you may be wondering why I'm dressed in this in this gear. Well, this is the gear that I wear during uh, the northern winter, which is the southern hemisphere summer. And um, in my background, I have Orion as we see it rising in the northern hemisphere. It's the exact opposite um, when you go to the southern hemisphere. And this is not Aurora. This is actually light glow that turned out green. I do have um, some Aurora that shows up um, in the presentation and I'll go ahead and get started with it. Um, do this, share screen. And as Scott says, chasing dark skies, that's basically what I do. And when I'm dressed in the gear that I'm wearing, um, you know, it, it, there's dark sky preserves, there's, you know, there's dark sky parks, there's places that you can go to see dark skies, but sometimes you go off the beaten path to see dark skies. And these, um, let's see, and I'll do this really quick. Like this place is off the beaten path. It's a campground, but it's not it's not a dark sky park. It's a campground that is under reasonably dark skies. And so sometimes you go find places like that and that's where you do your imaging. So you really have to map out the place beforehand. You have to be careful. So, so now let's get into the presentation, chasing dark skies. And, um, you know, I've begun putting my affiliations in my, um, you know, my opening slides. There's Great Lakes uh, Association of Astronomy Clubs. There's Explorer Alliance. I'm extremely proud of having this up here. Scott taking me in under the wing with the uh, both professional and amateur uh, astronomers and, you know, through them. We're, we're proud. We're proud to be, uh, you know, in cahoots. So thank you very much. Thanks for Absolutely. being part of it. You're yeah, a great ambassador. Of, it, I appreciate it. Some of these images were taken with Explore Scientific Equipment. So there's University Lowbrow Astronomers, my first club that I joined. There's the Astronomical League. I'm a proud member, proud member of RASC and a proud member of the Warren Astronomical Society for which I am on the board. Um, I'm currently the treasurer, but I may be promoted to first vice president because there's an opening and people are saying you should do it. Um, long as I get to go out to places like this and chase dark skies. So let's run through this really quickly. Why my segments are going to be called chasing dark skies, because a lot of my images are going to come from places where I believe the skies to be dark enough. And so this is a term that I've heard in my journey as an amateur astronomer. You know, what is a dark sky? And you, you hear different versions of this and, you know, without trying to read exactly what I've got here, you can see that you may, you may identify with it. It's really dark. We hear this on a lot of places and it's been like that throughout the years one disadvantage I have of being, you know, within five, you know, within the decade I started on this journey. So 
over time, you know, there are differences in there have been differences in how dark certain places have been. And so, you know, looking at some examples here, these are things that you hear. You know, we talk about astronomy has a scientific component. Science seeks to get the answers. Um, we're not necessarily, I do have an engineering background, love science. We aren't necessarily saying, you know, science tells us so. Science is the method by which we discover, we take our observations. And so one thing I wanted to do was try and use some of that process to qualify, well, what is a dark sky, you know? And you, some of these, you know, have been listed as true, you know, reasons that do accompany places that are pretty dark, but, you know, they're, they're sort of observations, but then again, there may be places if there are places I could take people and if they're not used to seeing a lot of stars in the sky, they'll be at a high border area saying, you know, I can't see my hands in front of my face. So I don't know that we can quantify those, you know, reasons for a dark sky. It just, I think this is what happens. It just seems really dark. And if you notice the pictures, that are interspersed this slide in the last one were taken at a site that is considered really dark it's kenton oklahoma where you know you're out in the middle of nowhere so you know some of this is visible um so i mentioned is there a way to tell without meters because as we know there are there are meters you can get i recently purchased one um that you can sample the darkness of a sky for yourself and then you get an empirical answer. But there may be clues we can look for in pictures or when we're at a location. And this is something I've picked up on over the, the years that I've been doing. You've got four places. And if you were to say, okay, which place is the darkest of the places i made it tough because image two was during the time it was really really cloudy there so you know you can't really compare these two milky way shots and then this shot which there appears to be sky glow and over here i think almost no one would say that this was the darkest place because the milky way appears brighter in all of these other three panels but the key is it's the clouds that are in the shot. A lot of Milky Way photography, dead clear skies, and oftentimes shooting at the brightest part of the core. One thing that I decided I would do, if I've got any kind of clarity in the sky, maybe there's some clouds around, I'm going to still take those photos. And what that enables me to do study the clouds now this is the clear sky so the only thing you really have is you know the milky way seems fainter and i used very similar processes to image all four of these and um you know the appearance of sky glow well here you go you can't really see it here this background is greenish it could be my processing but the trees all show up green so you know, so you're not sure if it's dark unless you realize that these clouds are Apache. There's Apache, you know, light color to the clouds over here. They look a little bit darker. Come over here. You can see the undersides of these clouds darker still. So, you know, that on this road, you know, it's it's truly darker. And then if you look at the darkness of these clouds, this turns out to be the one with the um, the highest uh, number. If I if I hit my meter, um, I would ex well here we've had a twenty one point ninety five. I haven't used the meter here. I expect a twenty one, but I don't expect a twenty one point ninety five. This is the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. This is one of my favorite places to image, but it's it doesn't 
quite compare in darkness to these two. This is another favorite place to image, but not so dark at all. No clouds, so you have to look for sky glow, and you have to look for, you know, if there's no clouds, you look for sky glow, and if you don't see it, you're probably in a lower boreal zone. And then as I mentioned here, just looking at the images alone, if you don't know how they were processed, I mean, that's the, you know, the astro imaging. You're stacking until you get the bright type of brightness and the type of detail you want in your images. So the key and something that I try to do is shoot them all with a very similar process that will show the Milky Way in any of these zones, but show it in a way that projects just how bright or not so bright it is in a particular zone. So that's part of my observation, but I felt like, well, that's still not really good enough because you know I can take an image, I could stack the images if I wanted to and fool people into thinking this is a really dark place. Well, enter the SQM and SQML meters, and mine happens to be an SQML. Um, and I tried to match with this shadow of me. Uh, I think I was working on my camera, and I took the picture. So with the my mouse pad right here, and there's the sky quality meter. This is an empirical way for those who want to measure your darkness a sky quality meter is one of the best ways to do it. Um, if you have a lot of experience going to different sites and seeing it with your eyes, seeing the sky color, um, darker sites tend to emit more of a grayish tone, whereas less darker sites wind up having a kind of bluer, a more bluer tone when the white balance is set to basically imitate what the eye sees. Um, I've got a link here for the Bortle scale, which even though it's Wikipedia, we've heard on the program that Wikipedia is but one source that can be, um, look, that can be looked at when researching, but they put a pretty good Bortle scale and it includes readings you get from the sky quality meter with Bortle zones and um, that can be found here um, at the if you look up Bortle scale in Wikipedia there's there are some good descriptions of what visually a dark site looks like versus what a not so dark site may look like and in, all the way down to Bortle 5 the Milky Way is visible it decreases in brightness to the human eye. So we took a reading 21.95. This was an SQM reading, and I think I put SQM reading. My readings were SQML. Um, gentleman had an SQM meter, and we pointed it at the Okie Tech sky, Kenton, Oklahoma. And these are some images. Now, this is the, the Milky Way, the core, when it's Milky Way season, what a lot of folks will shoot. Um, this dark nebula, there's dark nebula here. It shows up. The rift shows up. To the naked eye, you see the rift. Other things you see, the zodiacal light it tends to make an X with this part of the uh, winter Milky Way near Orion. Um, now I've got my modified camera on most of these shots. Here's Orion again, and this is the area above the California, the Pleiades, the Hyades, um, this region. These regions are easier to spot naked eye. And for all of this detail, you generally get sky glow as a part of the image when you're shooting at a site 2195. Bortle 1 is 22 on up. 21.95 is high Bortle 2. The Milky Way appears. This appears, and you can see a lot of this detail as the sun is setting. Um, you're in nautical, you're going from nautical to astronomical twilight, and already this part of the Milky Way is bright. 
Um, when the zodiacal light shows, it shows up and it's easily visible. And um, the Milky Way, no matter what section, is a horizon to horizon object. So despite any of the processing you see in these pictures, the Milky Way makes it easy to process it because it is that bright. Now, when you get into the skies I shoot at in Michigan, it's not as easy to process. You see this region from the Northern Bulge to Cygnus is fainter. The reading is 20.9. So this is almost a full, you know, number, just a, you know, single digit down and the sky quality changes. You can see the glow from light pollution on the horizon. You see, here's some glow over here. And when you try and image the region where Orion rises, it washes. You can get some of it here. There's the heart and the soul, but you you wash out along the horizon. The core, even on a cloudy night like this, can still be imaged pretty brightly. And that is why a lot of Milky Way photographers stick with going for the core and then try and put something below. Now, I was standing here. This, the images I take, I tend to shoot where I'm standing. So I was standing here. This is what this beach looks like with the core coming, rising to the southeast over here. And that's with a 20.9. That's a pretty good sky. You're looking up and you're seeing a lot of stars. But compared to 21.9, um, there's a difference in contrast and how the sky looks and then you only go down you know four tenths and you're on the edge of Bortle 4 this is a dark sky park that I'm showing you and these are different these are actually the three different regions of that dark sky park the boat launch area and there were boats out there here's an example of me processing an image the bright part of the Milky Way to where it still seems to shine brightly but you can see I lose a lot of detail in the process. Here are those dust lanes from the Orion region rising, but they're not as clear. And all of this glow is from a nearby town hmm. highlighting these trees. This was taken very recently. And so is this. Here's Lake Hudson, a beautiful lake. And the Cygnus region shows up, but nowhere near as bright as it has in other darker regions. So, and you notice the sky has a more metallic blue color, depending on how I process it. I may have overdone some vibrance or, you know, how whatever, whatever you do, there's still an indication here that this isn't as dark a sky and only at 20.5. And here's a danger that I want to propose. If we're not too careful, this park sits at 20.5 20.49 is the border for Bortle 5 so this park is almost getting too bright to really be considered a dark site because at Bortle 5 you're sort of on that border of are you really a dark site now it's a dark sky preserve so the goal is to preserve as much of the night sky as we can um, but the the amount of work an astrophotographer must do to pull out data, you know, the more work you have to do, you know, the less light you're getting from the heavens. You know, these objects that shine quite easily at a Bortal 2 or Bortal 3 zone are not shining through as easily, and you have to take more time just to get this sort of data. And then finally, my last slide, if it'll show. Okay, there we go. Future plans. So as I'll continue chasing, all of these places that I'm showing you are places that I've gone to image. And if I were to go around, I would guess this to be about a 20.8 or 20.9 over this, this is rather secluded beach in the uh, thumb of Michigan. This is an observing site 
um, for one of my astronomy clubs, University Lowbrow Astronomers. This is the the Roloff Roof Observatory, and this is essentially what the um, area around it looks like. This is the place where I first saw the Milky Way, and I'm curious to go back and see what the uh, what the numbers are. This bright, bright um, glow of light from a nearby town. I wouldn't be surprised if the number turned into a 19 point something, but that would be interesting because you see, I was able to get a decent image of the core of the Milky Way here. You can see it barely naked eye. So I expect a reading that puts this somewhere between four to five or so, but that then that's going to reset my expectation of how high a Bortle number can you image the Milky Way? here i this would have may have been a 21.0 it was an exceptionally clear night when i imaged um this cygnus region this was a reasonably clear night but i would expect a 20.9 and then you've got some of the lights from the lighthouse the distant lighthouse here this is a dark sky preserve in the thumb and i ended up with a pretty detailed rift here so again maybe 21 there's sky glow here this is the other side when i imaged the milky way in the upper peninsula and there's aurora that showed up in the camera along with the um cassiopeia and perseus side of the milky way um so up here 21.5 and then in this i expect maybe a 20.9 to 21 but I have to take it out here when it's clear like this and hit the meter and see what happens. And so just as I say here, what I expect to find is that dark sites may not average out to be as dark as they may have been remembered 15, 10, or even five years ago. Right. That's absolutely right. So, that's you right. know, that's, that's why you hear about fighting to save the night sky because Oh, and then I forgot to mention those that are watching from the Warren Astronomical Society would kill me if I didn't mention Stargate Observatory with this. I think this is a 10 inch refractor in here. Um, there's the Milky Way. You can barely see it. So the number here may be lighter still. But uh, so you know, preserving the night sky has a direct impact on how much you can see pictures can show you what really what is really there but depending on the how clear the night is and how much processing is done you you get an idea of how dark a site is but you really don't know until you go there and you uh you see it for yourself naked eye and um and when evaluating pictures on the internet it's a good thing one good thing you can do is notice where the focus in processing tends to be and look for the sky color. What sky color did they choose or were they able to leave the sky color at a certain, you know, color? You see the dark, you know, metallic, the dark blue here. You also see like the dark, it's like a bluish gray. So, you know, sky color and the type of sky color you can get and how intense it is gives you an indication of how dark it really is out there. So with that, Scott, that's my okay. presentation. And we're going to keep going with that as it can get, I can put on this gear and I can get out to some of these sites with the meter. Right. Well, that's that great. is the goal. Thank you so much for you know showing us such amazing uh, work, uh, as you always do. Um, well, it gives me great pleasure uh, to take us down to uh, the Cerro Tololo Inter-American uh, Observatory, otherwise known as CTIO, and we are at the, um, the Blanco 4-meter telescope with Don Davies, uh, who's doing an outreach program right now, and uh, Don, I'm going to bring you on and give you the spotlight. Um, I think you have a nice uh, group of people waiting to uh, to say hello to our audience. So thank you for coming on and making this effort. 
Fantastic. Scott, no, thank you so much for having us. It's right. always a pleasure to be on the Global Star Party and very excited uh, to call in today because, yes, we are calling in from the control center of the four meter Victor Blanco telescope here at the top of Sierra Tololo. Um, and I am here with about a little more than half of our team here. Uh, this is a group of folks. We are here with the Astronomy in Chile Educator Ambassador Program. Uh, this is a partnership that has been going on with the Associated Universities Incorporated and the Association of the Universities for Research in Astronomy, also known as Aura. And uh, there are 10 of us that actually, the vast majority of us have been waiting two and a half years for this expedition. We wow. were all selected back in 2020, right before COVID. So this project and this expedition has been postponed almost, I think, a half a dozen times. Oh uh, we are on day five of our expedition, and we've been here in Sierra Tololo for the last two and a half days. Uh, prior to that, we were in Santiago and La Serena. And tomorrow we have a couple of flights and some long drives to head to the Atacama Desert. Oh uh, boy. Yes. And to head up to Alma. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just sort of go around the group and let them introduce themselves real quick and uh, yeah, let you meet some of Wonderful. these amazing ambassadors. Okay. Thank you. So I'll start. Yeah. Great to see you all. Thanks for that great introduction, Dawn. Uh, greetings from what feels like the top of the world here, almost 6,000 feet up. So right. greetings to the rest of the world on this call. Uh, my name is Michael O'Shea, and I'm here with PopScope, short for Pop-Up Telescope, and we are a urban community-based astronomy movement. So great to see you all. Awesome. And this has been one of our, our fearless leaders uh, for our time here at Sierra Tololo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Juan Seguel. I'm an um, education and public outreach um, um, specialist for Noir Lab. Um, I'm, I'm glad to receive these ambassadors here in our facility of Noir Lab in Cerro Tololo at 2,200 meter high. Yeah, <laughs> Very high altitude. Yes. Jason? Hi, everyone. My name is Jason Schreiner. I'm the Planetarium Coordinator at the Museum of Arts and Sciences in Daytona Beach, Florida. And I'm happy to be an uh, ASAP ambassador with everybody. I'm also a NASA Solar System ambassador as well. Byron, Hello, I'm Byron Laverty. Uh, very, very happy to be among this group of very bright, uh, intelligent people who have the same passion as I do for astronomy. And uh, they have all discovered that I have a habit of wandering off and they have to chase me down. So that's <laughs> been my role so far. We're glad you could It's funny me. to see you on the other side of the screen here. So that's great. Good to see you. Uh, okay, so I'm Alan Strauss. I'm the director of education uh, for the Department of Astronomy, Stewart Observatory in Tucson, Arizona. So I lead the uh, public outreach programs at our mountaintop observatory and the K-12 wow. STEM science school. And uh, this is definitely the uh, experience of a lifetime and incredibly educational. So I hope that after Don uh, tells you all about it, that you will flood them with applications for future expeditions. So sure. Yeah. Great. Uh -huh. uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for done uh, for this uh, good introduction. I am uh, Abbas Mukhtarzadeh, a uh, member of the Charlotte Amadera uh, Astronomers, and also informal uh, science educator in Cyrus Academy in Charlotte. And uh, I'm glad to be here is uh, one of uh, is actually first and one of the most darkest uh, uh, skies uh, in the entire world. And uh, very amazed to see the dark sky in Saratolo and a lot of objects that in the Southern Hemisphere and uh, many galaxies like uh, Magellanic, uh, Magellanic clouds, uh, large and small. And the, the great uh, group of the people in ACAP and uh, NeuroLab and also ARA and AUI and uh, I'm very very happy to be within this uh, talented and uh, the smart and the enthusiastic people in Astronomy. Awesome. Oh, that's wonderful. Hi everyone, my name is Catalina Valencia. I'm Chilean and I work at environmental education with children, youth and adults too. And one of my hobbies and past passions has been astronomy. So I'm very glad to be sharing with this very uh, marvelous people, 
Um, I'm learning a lot from them. And I'm so happy to see that people from other countries that is in Chile are interested in our skies, in our ecosystems, and are willing to share it, to share it with the world, how important and how beautiful they are. So thank you all in advance for mm -hmm. that help. <laughs> and this is definitely one of our fearless leaders in Spot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Tim Spock, Director of Education and Public Engagement at AUI, and I am just here facilitating the program <laughs> and having lots and lots of good food. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> that's absolutely correct. They they are feeding us very well here. Yeah, so um, you guys so, are eating in the cafeteria that's there and uh, yes, yes, uh -huh, the, they do the have great food know. there. <laughs> and staying on site. Um, yes. So we are the sixth group of ambassadors that has uh, come through this program. So uh, we are, you know, joining a huge family of ambassadors from all over the world already and uh, learning a lot about what it takes to run these observatories, the types of science they're doing, getting an opportunity to meet the operators, the scientists, the folks that manage things behind the scenes. Um, so it's been a tremendous amount of information download. Uh, a lot of photographs have already been taken. Um, and so the expectation and the plan and the excitement for, for myself and this whole group is we get to take everything that we learned here in the last five days and in the next four or five days uh, back home with us. So part of this is uh, to continue to bring educational outreach of astronomy, especially the work that's being done here in Chile, uh, back home to our communities and to fellow astronomers and to the general public. So uh, thank you so much again, Scott, for letting us wow, come Wow, wonderful, about wonderful. This program. I and uh, it's it's a program that is open to all to apply. Mm -hmm. So I definitely encourage uh, anyone who has any interest in public outreach and astronomy and in having this kind of amazing experience uh, to submit an application because it is a once in a lifetime opportunity. What is the uh, what is the URL for this program? Uh, Astro Ambassadors. And is it .com or .com? Go, uh, dot, dot org. Astroambassadors.com. Yep. Astroambassadors.com. Astroambassadors.com. Okay. And you can Great. follow uh, both the program and all of us um, on social media as well. So, Don, what do you what do you expect people will be taking back with them from this experience? A, a tremendous amount of pictures that we will be calling through <laughs> for weeks. I think a, a, a tremendous understanding um you know i was mentioning it to to my fellow cohort here today that when we were in the process of watching them open up the victor blanco fully yeah. open the dome and the windows and move the telescope into position you know it's one thing to see these telescopes but it's another to get to meet the scientists and the folks that are running them and know the type of science that's coming from them that's being developed Specifically, the Victor Blanco is being used for dark energy research. Uh, we met one of the scientists today who's working on using it to discover satellite dwarf galaxies that are attached to our own Milky Way. So I think an understanding of the fundamentals behind why these telescopes are in these locations, the tremendous benefit they have to the scientific community, to education, um, and just how we may better be able to explain this and articulate this and deliver this message to, to our folks back home and to those that we interact with. That's fantastic. I know that these kinds of things are life-changing. Uh, I love the idea that you guys are doing this. Um, I've been down there as well. I've been inside the Victor Blanco four meter. Um, you know, it, it, uh, we should say who Victor Blanco was. Uh, he was a Puerto Rican astronomer, but, uh, and did, uh, I think he discovered uh, a, a galactic group, but he was also, I think the second, um, uh, you know, director, director. Of, yes. of the CTIO. And uh, at the time it was the largest telescope in the Southern hemisphere, mm -hmm. uh, uh, if I'm correct with that. Um, yes. But uh, I think the other thing that uh, is really cool about being down there is just the culture of astronomy. I mean, you've got, it feels like when you're down there that, you know, Chile is really turned on as a country to, they are. to astronomy, it's, right? It's nothing that I've, I've really got a chance to witness on the same level. Um, right. They are heavily invested on you know, astronomy research and in the telescope building, I mean, it is it is part of their culture. It is part of their heritage. And it's it's no surprise the skies that they have here 
are are brilliant and dark and it's it's a very rich astro tourism economy as well yes um so you know i think even though it's further down south and it may be hard to get to there's a lot that we can learn from what chile has been doing for the astronomical community you know for decades upon decades i i would agree with you well that's mm -hmm. fantastic well, uh, thanks a lot for coming on and making this effort. Uh, the connection's great. Uh, so kudos to Chile's uh, internet connection up there. And um, uh, you guys have a great time. And uh, uh, I'll catch up with you when you return to the States. So that's great. Thank you so much, Scott. Thank have you so much. OK. Bye. Bye. All right. Thank Take you. care, guys. Thank you. OK. All right, so that was that was a real treat, um, you know, uh, you know, to, to be able to connect like that to the CTIO uh, inside of that uh, amazing instrument. I have to highly recommend that if you can get down to Chile uh, and get, uh, you know, to Cerro Tololo, uh, they have they do have astrotourism tours, but the small there's like a small town. I, the name of this town is escaping me right now. But there are space murals on the walls of this town, uh, and it's where many of the astronomers live. And so, you know, you're going to get a triple dose of astronomy culture when you go down there. Um, of course, the uh, industry of astronomy and research astronomy is huge in that region. And, uh, you know, uh, when you go there, you'll be amongst some of the darkest skies there is on the planet. Uh, so. Uh, something really great also is, uh, you know, just the, the everyday people that are there, uh, you know, very, very uh, friendly people, and the food's great. So you're going to have a great time if you go to Chile. Um, we are going to take a 10-minute uh, break here, um, and then we're going to come back with uh, 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 more speakers, including Fraser Kane from Universe Today, uh, Marcello Souza from Brazil, um, uh, Cesar Brolo from Argentina. Uh, we're going to see um, some footage of the Apollo 17 launch and uh, what they've done uh, in researching the soil and rocks from uh, that particular mission. And then Frank Marches from uh, Unistellar and SETI. So stay tuned. If I can only find my way around. <laughs> Here we go.
Hello, uh, Fraser. I've listened to a lot of your podcasts and uh, you know, watch some things on YouTube. It's uh, it's an honor to be able to see you live on this thing. I'm going to have to follow along um, when you make your presentation. Sure. Thanks for uh, thanks for all that. Thanks for the views. Yeah, it, you definitely. I I've been listening to Astronomy Cast with you and uh, Dr. Pamela Gay for I think a couple of years now. That's awesome. So yeah, I think we're up to episode six sixty ish. So we've been yeah we've been at it for a while. People don't complain yeah. that we don't make enough episodes anymore. That never happens. People have enough yeah, of a backlog. Well. It's not like you both have nothing else to do. There are yeah. some things you have to, you, you've got a number of shows, yeah. that I think, that you're, a number of things that you're doing. Yeah, which I'm I'm assuming we'll get into shortly on the on this. Yeah, well, yeah, I was about to step away. I've I'd done a presentation on uh, night, my night sky photography, which. Um, That's awesome. This. Uh, this forum has basically helped me grow in my passion to doing it. And um, it's, that's amazing. Yeah. It's uh, I ended up, I'm at the point where I have one of these now a little sky meter. So when I go to a site, rather than look around and say, Oh, this is really, really dark. Yeah. I press the button and see what I got. And uh, sometimes I'm surprised. So at, what's your setup? Uh, what do you use for taking photos? So for taking photos, all I do I have a tracker, a uh, move, shoot, move tracker. Mm -hmm. Got the old Canon 6D. Sometimes I use my other daytime camera if I'm shooting during like the moon. So you just up. use a tracker and then you just shoot on your DSLR. I shoot on my DSLR. So I'm doing yeah. nightscapes. How do you um, like that? Or so. Yeah. And so I've gotten to the point where I'll do two minutes for the sky because that'll bring the Milky Way out even yeah. in a Bortle 5, maybe even Bortle 6 area. I'll do two minutes to capture the, you know, whatever foreground I'm at. And I usually like shooting over lakes mm -hmm. toward Canada. I shoot at, uh, in Michigan. So I go to Lake, uh, Huron a lot. Yeah. And then, um, if there's something special going on, like the lunar eclipse is happening at the same time, I'll do a quick frame for the, uh, so that I get the moon, you know, exposed you know, and, um, do a, a combination of them. And you'll probably get auroras from that perspective too, right? You got a nice view to the north if it's if there's activity. Yeah, I there are plenty of auroras. Yeah. And um I've taken a few, I've stumbled on them. We when we had a decent, we've had some decent storms, and all the way as far down as the thumb of Michigan, I've been able to capture auroras. That's I've amazing. captured an aurora when I didn't know what was going on. Um <laughs> yeah. My presentation, yeah, we, one of I've the had that too, yeah. There. Yeah, yeah where you like look at your north. pictures and you're like, wait a minute, there's some green in there. What? Yeah, it is like, is this a mistake? Then you shoot again. Oh no, it's not a mistake. The camera picked up some faint distant aurora on the yeah. horizon. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's so awesome. yeah, I'll tell people want to go see the aurora, and I'll tell them it's like you can sometimes tell if it's distant, you can kind of see the sky move. But a lot of the times you may not see it. You you just kind of have to have a camera to know yeah. that it's even out there. Yeah, yeah. It's a, I mean, I really like this technique for doing astro because a lot of people already have a DSLR. They're doing birding, they're doing macro, they're just, yep. you know, they're shooting like whatever. And then they want to get into astro. Once you get that tracking mount, then you can put on like a, you, you know, like a hundred millimeter 200 millimeter yeah. lens on top and start taking some pictures that rival what people would be gathering with a telescope. And it's just a much easier way. You know, if you've already got yeah. the camera, it's a way cheaper setup to go that way. I like that a lot. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, we were talking about it. It's a matter of time, you know, with Astro, how much, you know, how long an exposure yeah. do you take? So if your skies aren't as dark, it'll take a longer exposure, but you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. You and, just clean uh, up the noise. Like the more, the more yeah. you stack it, the more you can pull it out. Yeah. So now you, you've got clear signal. Yeah. You know, whatever you, your data is a little clearer. So that works for, um, it works for landscape astrophotography as we call it. But the caveat is this, we're also composing. So the Milky Way's here. If I go 
two hours, the Milky Way is there and my composition might be shot. So yeah. either either I have to do creative imagineering or right. accept a much smaller time when right now, two minutes, if I could go up to five minutes, I probably would. And um, if I manage to, most times, if you're not guiding, I think you can get up to five minutes. That's just something I have to try. So it gets but... a little blurry when you go longer than two minutes on your. Right. Setup. So, yeah. So you have to do two because your your sky, like I have a sky in the background here. Your sky will look great if it if it tracks it. But then your everything's blurry. So you have to take yeah. another photo without tracking. And it's just easiest to do it for the, you know, same amount of time, same settings so that it's a natural looking like it's like you took it in one shot and yeah. it's really what's there. But you do have to do a composite of the two. Yeah. So that is. So would you, know, you like sense. make the, the switch over to a to a telescope setup? Are you pretty happy with this? Direction. Well, so for pictures like the one that's behind me and I'll mm -hmm, move out mm -hmm. of the way. That's amazing. That's, yeah. Yep. That's the Orion region right there. And you see that bridge. So I did two. There, there I go. <laughs> I did two images, one for that Orion region of the Milky yeah. Way and then another one without it tracking so that I could get that bridge. Right. Solid. And then I and did a composite. composite them. Yeah. And that's yeah. So it's taking a lot of time as in classic um i wouldn't use a telescope because i want that landscape you want that wide so yeah and so you for you it's like if you don't have like some ground underneath it's not interesting to you like you it want still that. is it always is that pleiades up there in the yeah, california yeah, yeah. Yeah. i did a wide field of those two with that rift going through it yeah the interesting thing is we'll talk to an astrophotographer who takes it and says there's a whole lot of gas and there's a whole lot of stuff around those two and i'll say well of course you're still in the milky way and then i show them the big picture and they go oh wow that's yeah. why because you know so i've always per kind of preferred the wide angle but th that shot's amazing yeah. like i can see the air glow i can see the light pollution from the city yeah. um and it, it all adds to the composition which is which is really nice yeah that's yeah, a great it's a great picture it's almost like you. like kind of like even like the composition like on the one side you've got the one color the yeah, yellowish on the way. on the right hand side and then it's sort of shifting over to the pinks on the other side it's really neat yep. yeah yeah like that, that one a lot. it was an unintended effect but i thought it was really neat that you had so you know that there's a larger city over there and interesting enough razor that is canada because we're shooting right. across lake Huron, Huron, yeah, yeah, where at yeah. this location, and so it's, yeah, you it's got, great, got right? Like that kind of stuff, like you embrace it, like that's just part of the absolutely, like it can add to the composition of the picture. Like so many people are always just trying to fight light pollution, but in fact, light pollution can be part of the picture if you can constrain it and keep it into its own little and spot. Like, I really like shots of the moon with some cloud. Like, once you've seen a, a thousand shots of the moon, you're like, okay. Fine, yeah, that's yeah, the move, yeah. but, but the cloud. Often, often Adrian also mixes in clouds. Yeah. Not that he's bringing them in or anything, but but yeah, no. uh, they just know, happen to be there. Definitely, yeah. uh, he's shooting through clouds, or you know, with the Milky Way and and clouds together, and uh, he's going after the composition, and it yeah. really is. Yeah, that's wonderful. His, his images often really sing, and so I I really enjoy having his work on the show, but. Uh, but we are, uh, we're back and um, uh, we have Fraser, Fraser Kane from Universe Today and uh, the Astronomy cast is in the house. And uh, so it's really great. I, Fraser, I'm a fan of, of, your, of your work and uh, have been watching uh, Universe Today for a long time. And I, I get a lot of information from it. Wow, and, I had no idea. Uh, I think That's it's awesome. fantastic. And, um, uh, so I, I, I wanted, uh, maybe, uh, I, I doubt it, but I, maybe there are some people watching this show today that haven't heard of Universe Today. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I know that you have a tremendous audience and, um, uh, you know, I've got a little bio on you that you, you know, you're the co-host of Astronomy Cast, which is a podcast, I believe, and um, uh, co-creator of the Guide to Space video series on YouTube. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe you can bring us up to speed of sure. uh, 
your yeah. background and sure yeah university so today i founded started. yeah i founded universe today as a space and astronomy news website in 1999 and did that as like a like a side project while I was working at my regular job in a tech company. And mm -hmm. I just fell in love with just both. Like I, I, I'd always been a fan of space and astronomy, but I really fell in love with communicating it, being a journalist mm -hmm. and just started to maintain the site. And after a couple of years, I'm like, okay, this is all I want to do for the rest of my life. Now I just got to figure out how to, how to get out of the old gig and into doing this. And in the beginning I wrote all the work, you know, everything that was being reported on the website. And then over wow. time, more and more people jumped on board. And so now we've got a pretty big crew, we've probably got about 15 writers at various stages of full and, and part-time freelance. Goodness. And okay. then as, as you mentioned, I'm the co-host of the astronomy cast podcast and we're up to like 660 episodes of, of that. We started that about 15 years ago. And then about 10 years ago, I started doing these videos on, on YouTube, mostly just to get practice on, right. on how to educate and explain things um, in that format. And again, you know, doing that for 10 years, we put out, several videos every week and have uh you know pretty gigantic followings across all of these platforms which is a total honor so yeah. so that's what i do you made your dream come true you know yeah so exactly that's, yeah that's that is the uh, great american uh, story right there so yeah um but uh, uh fraser what what are, what do you think have been the highlights of you know i mean things that you just uh you know if you if you had to count on two hands what uh uh, have been the, the most amazing highlights of doing all this work, what, what would you say? Well, I mean, the, the greatest privilege is being able to talk to people who you are starstruck for the mm. even the fact that you're talking to them. I've had a chance to interview and talk with many Nobel laureates, astronomers, the principal investigators of many of the missions that you're familiar with, the heads of various space agencies, people in orbit, it's amazing. Right. Oh, wow. You just got to, you pinch yourself. And, and now it's funny because people are like, oh, is there anyone that you really wish you could talk to you, but you haven't had a chance to? And I'm like, no, like I'm at the point now, which is amazing that, that when it occurs to me that I would like to talk to somebody, I am able to, if I'm persistent enough, I can get to yeah. them and convince them to talk to me. So that's like, that is the first five sections on wow. on my on my favorite list is just this ability and then the other part of it is of course just i love being able to share my enthusiasm for space and astronomy with with other people and mm -hmm. when you get that feedback and i'm sure you get that as well when you get that feedback where someone is like i had no idea that i like this stuff yeah it's the juice it is yeah and then out you know i saw you were live streaming this picture of Saturn or you were uh, you were interviewing this person or whatever. And I got really into it. And then I watched more and more of the videos. And and now I'm just finishing up getting my Ph.D. in oh, as an astronomer. And you're wow, just like, oh, that's great. That's amazing. That's great. Right. Yeah, that yeah. is amazing. Do you uh, do you uh, see yourself doing um, I mean, will you teach at a university or will you continue doing uh, the work that you're doing do you see it evolving to something else no i i people always ask me like what's your goal <laughs> I, I have no goal well you I've, you have I've, achieved I've a goal i mean that's exactly time, it. yeah you know yeah. so yeah uh -huh. i've um and so like all i want to do is get better at what i do i want to mm -hmm. do a better job with the kinds of stories that we cover with universe today get them faster get them more comprehensive dig deeper and mm -hmm. provide a really kind of authentic voice to the people who are interested in this in this topic and that is a never ending sisyphusian task to get to the point that that the reality matches my ambitions for how good it can be for what we do oh, that's great that's great i uh, and um uh your your uh, you know your personal um interest in astronomy aside from the journalism and stuff what what is it that turns you on about uh about exploring the sky well i've always been a giant space nerd like as a little kid 
Um, yeah. I had books about space. I would watch Star Trek and science fiction. My my dad woke me up in the morning in 1981 to watch the first launch of the space shuttle. Um, I mm. I would organize star parties mm -hmm. on this little Canadian island that I grew up on. Um, I would uh, when I was in high school, I joined the journalism program there and mm -hmm. I would report on what you could see in the night sky. I bought my own telescope and and would set up at my parents' parties and sort of, you know, do some the, sidewalk uh, astronomy. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. And so it's it's weird to me that I didn't start out in this as a career. It just it had never occurred to me that the uh -huh. thing that I loved doing in high school would also could also be my career. And yeah. so I had this weird side jaunt through the tech industry, which was really helpful because, you know, running, I'm sure you're aware, you know, you run a business, it's very yeah. tech heavy to manage the servers and all of the technology that's involved. Oh, yeah. And I leave that I was to able other to, people. In my, right. And so I didn't have company. the money. <laughs> yeah. I didn't have the money to have other people do that. I had to do it myself. And so sure. it was, it was very useful that I was both technically competent and had this passion for doing the communication and and so that was Perfect you know i have blended. people now but but back then it was it was tough so yeah no it's been it's been this sort of single it's it's yeah again it's super weird to me that i didn't fall into this as a career right away but but i found my yeah. way back to it and even the times when i every now and then i i get i had an amazing opportunity a couple of years ago to go and work with the x prize to help them build a version of their platform um, where people could start their own projects. And all I wanted to do was get back to universe today. Like it was, I, could, right. I had a great team. I was able to work on projects that were interesting. And yet all I could do was just like, ah, oh, I just want to get back to doing work on universe, universe today. today. Cause that's yeah. what you love. Yeah. Yeah, now totally. I saw something also in, in this bio and, and this might be an older bio, uh, but it talks about Hero X. Yeah, what, that's the Hero X. That? that was the that was the the offshoot of the X Prize. I see. Yeah, I see. Yeah, and so yeah, it was sort well, of like I, it's it's still there. You it's a, a lot of NASA's um, competitions are run on the Hero X platform, so you can um, like they want to know how to deal with poop on the moon or they want to know how to recycle water on long duration missions. And so they, they put this project on the hero X platform. Then people around the world come up with ideas and then the best idea wins a prize. So it's like a mini version of the X prize. Right. No, that's great. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Um, well, gosh, uh, uh, Frazier, I'm, I was blown away that you accepted uh, my invitation to come on to the program today. Um, uh, I, uh, you know, I always admire, uh, people that do astronomy outreach in a big way. Um, uh, a lot of us, uh, that are in the outreach community, I know that you get this, um, you know, it's a gateway to all of science. Um, you know, uh, we have, um, when I, when I talk about this now to the, uh, Eclipse community. I'm starting to get more involved in the Eclipse community because we got two great eclipses coming yeah. up. One in 2020, 2023, an annular and a total in 2024. Uh, you know, they say, well, you know, uh, uh, it, it the the larger group, uh, the bigger opportunity for us in astronomy outreach is getting people to see something like an eclipse. And they're saying that something on the order of like double or triple the number of people that saw the 2017 eclipse mm. in the United States, which was, you know, NASA was calling it the world's greatest uh, science event. Now this will be, uh, this will this will go beyond that. Um, you know, I think that we're, we're gonna see a, another big surge in people getting involved in astronomy or being, a, in, uh, you know, uh, exposed to it. And, uh, you know, I think that programs like Universe Today and your podcast are incredibly important to um, ushering in people to take that on as part of their life, you know, maybe make it a lifestyle type yeah. of choice. But I also the other thing I, I, I'm glad to hear about your, your story about uh, how you found, uh, uh, you know, something to do that to make your life dream come true, because uh, there are a lot of people 
that are into astronomy, amateur astronomy and stuff, and they have a job that they hate. They just <laughs> absolutely hate. And astronomy might be an escape for them or something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I would encourage any of those people that want to make that break and make their dreams come true to just go and do it. Yeah. One of the my favorite projects that we did was this thing. I don't know if you heard of it. The, we, the virtual star party. We did this a couple of years back hmm. where we would live stream views from telescopes from around the world. Yeah, so yeah, sure. Have, yeah. And so we had like 10 telescopes posted by various amateurs in their backyard and and in different parts around the world one guy was in New Zealand showing us the sun while other people were in in Canada or whatever and it was it was great and and people just couldn't get enough of it they couldn't believe how amazing it was that they were able to actually see a view of the night sky and you're like a DJ taking requests like oh i've heard yeah. there's a comet in the sky right now can we try and see that and you're like well, let's try you know and then then one of the astronomers like i got it i got a picture of it and and you can just see that 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 connection with the night sky is something that is universal like nobody hates space everybody loves it no that's true <laughs> and and so no matter where people come from they'll come and take a look through the telescope eyepiece at Saturn or whatever. And 50% of the time you blow their minds, which is right. such a really great experience. So, so yeah, I know I couldn't have, have ended up in a more rewarding and entertaining uh, career. Right. I'm reading some of the uh, comments here that are coming through. Uh, Chris Larson, I'm watching on YouTube says, you know, Fraser's the real deal and an all around nice guy. Oh, um, so you got some great fans out there. I would count myself among them, and uh, you know, love what you do. And um, well, we should work on some projects together. Uh, <laughs> that would be an honor for sure. Yeah, for sure. yeah, I could think of some ideas. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that, yeah, you guys that have will some be... tech. You guys have some gear. I have some problems. So maybe we can help bring astronomy <laughs> maybe we can to more people. It. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Wonderful. Awesome. Well, Frazier, that's that's uh, that's great. Thanks for spending a little bit of time with us in your busy schedule. And no um, problem. Um, you know, well, thanks uh, for having me. Yeah, thank you. And uh, so, you guys uh, watching, uh, make sure that you tune in to um, uh, UniverseToday.com and uh, you know subscribe to his programs and uh, listen to Astronomy Cast. You know, wonderful. You're lot so i did it did it better than i could so thank you so much yeah good luck with the rest of your <laughs> of your program thanks frazier take Great care right. talking to you frazier all right thanks adrian yep. bye-bye okay that was great um so uh, uh now we're going to go from uh you know, north america down to south america and meet up with marcello souza in brazil uh, Marcello, uh, great to have you on the program. I know that we're working on the next issue of Skies Up Magazine. Um, uh, I, I still have to write my little column, which I'm going to do. Uh, but uh, soon we'll have a new magazine that uh, you can download for free. Uh, so you just go to explorescientific.com forward slash skies up and get your copies. There's back issues right now, and this is a truly global astronomy magazine, absolutely free of charge. So, um, but Marcello, thanks for coming on to the Global Star Party. As I mentioned to the audience earlier, this is our last uh, Global Star Party of the year. And uh, we will start again in January for, uh, you know, starting with the 110th Global Star Party. Um, but um, it's, uh, it's great to have you on so many of these things, uh, Marcello. You've, you've been very... Uh, consistent and uh, always bring, bringing us great news from Brazil. I'll hand it over uh, to you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation, Schwartz. Unfortunately, our Brazilian, the Brazilian team is out of the World Cup. But today, Argentina uh, won the game and it will be in the, the final of the World Cup, and uh, I'm cheering for Argentina now, because they have a, a fantastic <laughs> player that is Messi. For me, he's the best player that you have in the world that is Messi. Yeah, yeah. that's great. It's great. It's well, it's going to be a very interesting game because uh, we have, um, you know, a team that's never been, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, a champion of the World Cup, and uh, 
you know, going up against a, a formidable, you know, team, which is in Argentina. So, um, you know, it was sad for me to see Brazil get knocked down, um, uh, but not really knocked down. You know, you guys have five championships. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's pretty it's, awesome. Let's wait to see. But uh, tomorrow I'm cheering for Morocco. Uh, okay. Uh, it would be fantastic if we have in the final Morocco versus Argentina. Yes, it would be. Uh, something unexpected. Yes. Uh, uh, today, as it is the last program, I will talk about the, what's happening in Brazil in this period. Yeah? Because it is a special period for us here, like I believe in other places in the world. Yeah. Uh, let me see if he... Okay. Here are our contacts. And uh, here is our country here. There's a big country here in South America. But we, the, our country is located between the equator line and the Tropic of Capricorn. Yeah. Then for us, next week, we will begin the summer. And also is a special period because you have the Christmas here. Well, uh, as in the United States, you have obviously celebration for Christmas, you have here, but something that is different from other countries, I will show now what happened in this period. In other countries, you, you, like the United States and the countries in the North Hemisphere, you have the seasons well defined. Uh, you know when you, you have winter, when you have the summer, but here in Brazil, we have a part of Brazil that you don't have four seasons as you have in other places in the world. Yeah. Hmm. I, I, here in our state, in Rio de Janeiro, and uh, we are located here 270 kilometers far from Rio de Janeiro, the North region. And uh, this is our period here. Not today, because it's uh, raining a lot here in, in, in our region in Brazil. You have floods here, and you uh, have many problems because of the rains. But uh, generally in this period, it's very hot today. It's very hot here, very very hot, and uh, many people go to the beach. Yeah, here is the beach of Copacabana that is very famous. Yeah. And in this period, we organize events like this. We go mm, near to the uh, the beach and organize exhibitions. We use our solar telescope to allow people to look to the sun and organize many activities like this in this period in January. But you, you need to go where the people are here that uh, most of the people go to the beach in this period. So here are activities near the beach and we are planning to do this in January. That is the holiday here in Brazil. Well, we began here from Christmas until February is a period of holidays here in Brazil. And uh, most of the people here in our state goes to the beach. Near, then this activity that you organize uh, in a beach located in our city here in Brazil. But again, I will talk about this, that I think that's something different that you have here. Uh, here you see the equator, the, the Tropic of Capricorn here. And you have roads here in Brazil that indicates that you are crossing the line of the Tropic of Capricorn. I don't know. I believe that the other countries have the same. I don't know United States, probably you also. You don't cross the tropics in United States. You don't have lines like this. No? But here in Brazil, we have in many places. You see here. Here you have here you are crossing the line of the Tropic of Capricorn. Here also the Tropic of Capricorn. Mm. Then we have many roads in Brazil with uh, signals like this in the roads. Yeah. And they show where is the Tropic of Capricorn in, in, the, in the, the country. And most uh, is located in the southeast of Brazil and south region of Brazil. Yeah, that uh, where the, you have the line of the Tropic of Capricorn. But you have part of Brazil, in north region of Brazil, that you have the line of the, the equator crossing the country. Here is a monument that you have in the state that's called Amapá. And in, in, what you see in the floor 
is the part that you have the south hemisphere and the north hemisphere. The one side of the line is the south hemisphere, and the other hmm. side is the northern hemisphere. And you have a sundial here. Né? The sundial, uh, cool. during, during the equinox, uh, they, they have here. The, during the equinox, you will see here the sun. Yeah, wow, this got to be the one of the biggest sundials in the, yes. in the world. Yes, it's a very big sundial. But it's to, uh, to show what's happening in the equinox. And also here you have the, the line of the equator here. Uh, the name of the state is Amapá, and it's located in the capital that's Macapá, right, in the north region of Brazil. It's a big monument to celebrate uh, the line of the equator crossing Brazil. Yeah. But what you have different from other countries, né? because you have here this, the uh, now in December, you know that the, the sun will be in the Tropic of Capricorn one day uh, next month, next week. Né? Then it's very hot for us here in the southeast of Brazil. But here is the Amazon. Né? In the Amazon, part of the Amazon is near. Né? most of the Amazon is near the equator. Right? Then we have different seasons there. We have only two seasons, not four seasons. That, uh, uh, mm -hmm. The first season begins in December now and goes until May. And it is rainy and rot. Because it is called winter, because you have rains every day. And I was there and they say for you, oh, I think that's 4 p.m. And near 4 p.m. you have the rain, then they, all the shadows is according to rain, before and after the rain. They say, no, you need to go because you begin to rain. Every day you have rains and it is hot. And the summer is from June to November. It's dry, but you have also rains then because you have clouds. And also in the winter, you have more clouds and it's rain. And it is warmer. Then, all the period of the year is hot, but uh, one period is warmer than the other period, but is hot every day. Yeah. But you have a period of rains and a period of rains. Então, for them, for part of Brazil, we don't, uh, we can't talk about the seasons like uh, you you talk in United States, in Europe, because you don't have the seasons here uh, as you have. Uh, it's a different kind. Then the equator is a region different from the other parts of the world. Uh, that's a region. And the, the Brazil is a tropical country uh, because it's located between the equator and the Tropic of Capricorn, most of the country. And uh, it's something that is different from the other parts of the world. Uh, and this time, uh, we are near Christmas. We have, uh, as in many countries in the world, we have big trees uh, with lights. Uh, this is our city. You have in many places of Brazil this kind of uh, lights. Uh, a lot of celebrations, wow. uh, Christmas. Uh, many places here in Brazil like this. Many cultures in the world do this in this period. Uh, but uh, something that, uh, uh, as it is a Christian celebration, one of the most important uh, moments is the born of Jesus Christ that we are celebrating next week in December 25th. But uh, for us uh, as astronomers, something that uh, ever we try to understand what it means is the star of Bethlehem. I don't know if uh, my pronunciation is correct, in English, but uh, Bethlehem, I think that is correct. Yep, that's exact. Yeah, we say Star of Bethlehem. Oh, thank so you. You got you, it. Man. You got it. <laughs> mm -hmm. In Portuguese, it's Estrela de Belém. Uh, that's uh, quite important. <laughs> but uh, you have many astronomers that try to find a natural event that can be associated with the Star of Bethlehem. They try, they ask, they try to uh, find a comet in the spirit, 
at the other possibility that triple conjunction of planets have many uh, conditions that they analyze and to find the, a way to understand what is in the Bible. Yeah. This is a part uh, in the Gospel according to Saint Matthew, they, where they talk about the star of Bethlehem. Bethlehem. And now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and they are coming to worship him. You have another part of the Bible where they talk about the star of Bethlehem. And the, another passage of the Gospel called St. Matthew, they call, we can consider that the star was appearing in a specific time. And there was need of some prior knowledge to be able to recognize it in the sky. We have many other passages of the, the Gospel or the Bible, and uh, generally they talk about a star that uh, they saw in the east and then moved to the south, from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. Then many, many astronomers that are Christians analyze this and try to find. First, you have uh, doubts about the, the year of the born of Jesus Christ. Right? We have uh, different interpretations in the Bible. And many of the research consider that uh, he born six until two years before the year that we consider the born of Jesus Christ. But we don't have a specific year that you can define for this. Then in these uh, possibilities, they analyze uh, events in the sky that can represent the start of Bethlehem. The first possibility is that it might be a comet. The other possibility suggested by Tisho Brahe may be a explosion of a supernova. And uh, from Kepler, you have other possibility that you analyze until today, that the conjunction of planets, you have a triple conjunction between Jupiter and Regulus, and six months later, you have a conjunction with Jupiter, with Venus and Jupiter, auto other conjun triple con conjunction in this period between Jupiter and Saturn. They imagine that this can be a possibility. Right? But it is a way that we are trying to understand the suggestions that you have in, in the Bible. Right? Ever you have this discussion about the faith and reason. Right? For St. Augustine, the appearance of the Star of Bethlehem was a miracle. But if you consider the Bible of a science book, it's very difficult to understand some passages that you have in the Bible. Then you have Galileo that said something that is what you consider in science for us. No? You have faith and science and reason can walk together. No? with no problems, if you consider, the, uh, as you suggest, the Bible shows the way to go to the heaven, but not the way the heavens go. And say, the science that says how, what we see in the sky, or what uh, the models that you can make predictions about uh, what you see in the future in the sky, mm -hmm. is the science that motivated the, uh, us and the show to us possibilities in the future. And Einstein also, I will finish with this quote from Einstein, that there are only two ways to live your life. One is thought that nothing is a miracle, and the other is a thought, is, is thought everything is a miracle. Then we don't know what is in the Bible, in other religious books that have people in different religions in the world. But we respect all the religions and the science and have no problems with any religion. It's a way that we find to understand the universe. And with this knowledge, we build our society. 
and uh, we have uh, today everything that you use and uh, what we are doing now that you use a virtual system how that you use a uh, conquest made by humanity by the human being during the short time that you have the civilization in the history of the earth and uh, was possible to bring so many technology to us and make people to live more and in a better way. Thank you very much, Scott. Well, Marcello, thank you very much. You it's nice to part with some words of wisdom from Einstein. So thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Thank you very well, great. Uh, Marcello, I hope you have a great uh, Christmas. Well, I will be talking to you um, uh, before, uh, you know, before we uh, get to the Christmas season here, um, you know, we have a magazine to put out. And, um, um, but uh, I, I personally want to thank you for all the contributions that you've made, uh, not only to the magazine, but to Global Star Party. And we hope to see you back next year. So uh, thank you very much, Scott, for all your support and help. It's a great pleasure ever to be here with, all the, with you and all the friends here. And uh, I would like to wish to everybody happy Christmas and a happy new year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Well, we're we are going to go a little bit further south in uh, in South America, back again to Argentina, where I think Caesar might be happy about the FIFA situation as well. Just a little. Just, Just a little, little bit. Yes. Are those are all the people that yes, are in God. your living yes. room that were watching the game? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. The typical Argentinian guys. Quiet. <laughs> Quiet. So I say they are cold people. Yes. They don't they don't suffer anything about football. Oh no. <laughs> Uh, please, uh, please. I wonder how many people had heart attacks yeah. <laughs> and yeah. 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 over the game. Yeah. We are neighbors. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm cheering for Argentina now. Yeah, yeah so I think uh, I think Cesar, you have gained a, an entire country of followers that want you to see this through. So uh, you know, Brazil, and uh, I tell everyone in the states. Argentina is the team. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. We, Many, uh, the, the, craziness, the craziness is uh, about the, the Argentina team is incredible. Um, something that we, uh, in, in Bangladesh, Bangladesh is something that, that hmm. if, you, if you find in internet the Bangladesh uh, uh, fans uh, of the Argentina team, it's totally insane, totally really? crazy. Oh. Yes, but Interesting. they are two. It's a country with two hundred. Uh, is it because it's Indonesia? It's two hundred fifty million people, and they have a huge number of fans, more than Argentinians. More than Argentina. <laughs> and if you found, if you if you search the internet today, you can find the Bangladesh or, uh, uh, fans in the streets, and they said. Come on, this is so crazy. Uh, yes. Today was a totally crazy day in, in, in our uh, world because we stopped at 4 p.m. to watch the, because we, we have a big screen in the, in the store, of course, and we stop and go to, <laughs> go to, to watch the game. Um, yes. the, we don't suffer every time we suffer. But uh, in the last game, uh, maybe you can show Marcelo was a, a, a nightmare <laughs> with the, with the Netherlands was a nightmare was totally insane. Hmm. Um, today, of course, that we are, we was praying. You know, so they say, okay, one okay, one goal, okay, two goals, okay. But this guy, uh, Croatia, was a, yeah, three goals, and we. Really, we, we was preaching to say, uh, okay, no preaching, uh, um, another thing, uh, pray, pray, <laughs> pray to say, okay, we need to stop this. Yes, yes, because uh, uh, it is something like, like it's magic. And it's, uh, the people here 
enjoy a lot. Of course, the Brazil is is, is a is a it, it, it really we we were sad about Brazil because it in Brazil they like the football like us. Um, really, we enjoy a lot, and when we have our teams. Um, in, in South America, we have a, a huge uh, championship mm. where we have a lot of different uh, different teams from uh, the countries from South America, the La Copa Libertadores, or the another one is uh, Copa Copa America is for 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 nations, but uh, Copa Libertadores uh, it's for all South America teams. Not not selections teams, not the countries, if not the. Um, this is when when this star ever ever we have teams from Brazil and Argentina, uh, the, the the bigger numbers of teams and they play very very, very well. Uh, well, this Sunday I don't know. Okay, but yeah. but you have a <laughs> but you have a fantastic player that is Messi. For me, yeah, the Messi play in the world. Oh, and yeah, he, Messi is one of them. He, they, he gets today, all the attention, but uh, there's there's other great players he, there. Yeah, yeah but he's, he's responsible for Argentina now yes, in the, the final because he, he in the last today today he was responsible for everything. He was fantastic. Yes, yes, yes. It's something that that it's not only Messi is. Uh, um, Julian Alvarez, uh, well, a, a lot of different players, and something that is crazy that they are very, very young. They are kids, are 20, 22 years old, 23, 24, the same age of my my my, my boys, my kids. It's, it's incredible uh, because they are thinking that they are in a final in his uh, first uh, World Cup. And it's something but, that, that... But if you doubt Messi, it's always possible. He, mm, he's fantastic. No, yeah, I so think that, fantastic. no. I think that, I think that, but... I'm oh, sorry that we are talking about football and... <laughs> <laughs> for Argentina and How do we Brazilian. connect the universe to all of this? <laughs> yes, but I think... I'm a think cosmologist that, and a telescope maker. <laughs> Messi is a great star, about stars. But, but I think that in many... In, uh, Marcello, you maybe you can see a lot of different uh, situations in the Argentinian se se selection, but ever ever the, the Argentinian selection was uh, with Messi was was not a great a great uh, players, but now it's different. It's different the technician is different. The kid, the, the the young team without only. The only stars is Messi, but the other ones are people that say, "Okay, is it like a, we do you have maybe a, a, a huge massive stars, but do you have a constellation, not a constellation, a cluster of less <laughs> mass stars where they are thinking in in the future?" And I think that 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 it's a, it's a great and maybe maybe another. Morocco, Morocco don't have a, a, a great star, uh, uh, and but really they they work like a, a, a huge selection team, and of course that that. Uh, I'm cheering for for the both things, Morocco and the Argentina to be in the final. Or I see what I have tomorrow. The, <laughs> but for both are a terrible. It's something that I can't imagine. Really, really. <laughs> It will be very, very stressing for these guys. <laughs> Congratulations yeah. to, to Argentina. Well, thank you, thank you. Well, thank you. We, we have to, you know, we have to resume back to astronomy. Um, back but to astronomy. <laughs> yes. But I, I, I will say this. Okay, in Global Star Party, one of the really cool things about it is that you do get to learn about the culture of other countries. <laughs> yes. Oh, so that's yes. that's. That's really great. Yes, because when you come to Brazil or or Argentina, you can have more ex expectation about how is the people. Uh, yeah, you know that. That's that, right. Uh, we I invite like like Marcelo say uh, to to visit uh, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, uh, because it's, it's it's incredible, incredible Peru, well Paraguay. 
Uruguay. It's full, full of, of amazing, amazing landscape, people, the culture is really huge. And uh, we have um, uh, 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 people in the south of Brazil, in the south of Brazil is different to the north. Here in Argentina is the same, the west or the northeast. And of course, Chile, or do you have a, a expect, a, a, you know, uh, different colors of, of uh, totally uh, something that, for example, um, it's something about that we we uh, we read uh, in, in the New York Time magazine or the newspaper about why uh, uh, and journalists say why uh, 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 Argentinian selection don't have uh, black people. I say, come on, you need to come here to understand what which is Brazil, which is Argentina. Really, we we think like a color people come on you are watching us really we um we uh, um we feel himself like a color people absolutely we are not white because it's impossible for us <laughs> yes and, so, uh, and we're all different say, colors absolutely we yes. are color people we are color right. people that's and, right and uh, the most important thing is who made the barbecue? No, the other. Who oh, made the barbecue? Yes, yes. It's, it's, <laughs> in Brazil, it's peto corrido. If I go, yes, yes, I know. Yes. Churrasco, churrasco. Yes, okay. okay. Churrasco, uh, in Brazil, churrasco. Churrasco, barbecue, yes. Uh, barbecue. But barbecue is, is to say, if, uh, the, in English, uh, the English word, of course, that is asado or churrasco in, in Brazil. Something that I, I know from Brazil is espeto corrido. That is the, the kind of, uh, in the, some part of Brazil, maybe. Uh, but it's about the churrasco and the quality of the, of the meat. Um, um, well, I, I'll take, I, I'll took, uh, I'll took some things about astronomy, about uh, gravity. <laughs> you like. If you have, we can, let's see, you yeah. have. <laughs> Yes, maybe. How many minutes left? Yes, one minute. You yeah. got, uh, okay, you got eight minutes. <laughs> no, really, no, yes. Of eight minutes, go. <laughs> I enjoy, I enjoy to talk all that you, you, <laughs> you prefer, really. Um, mm. Let me check what I can. Uh, well, do you remember the picture of of uh, 47 Tucana of the last? Yes. You, you can you can see uh, in your screen. I, I think that I am I'm sharing the screen of the Pix Inside program. Yes, it and looks here, great. Yes, yes. Here, do you have the picture processor of the of the two weeks ago? Mm. And 47, uh, 47. Sorry. 47 to Canai, 47 to Canai. It's a very interesting cluster. And the cluster is, no, you can see in the direction of the small Magellanic cloud, but the cluster is not inside the small Magellanic cloud. If not, that it's a, it's a cluster in the same line of, of vision. Um, it very, it's very interesting because it's not so massive like uh, uh, Omega Centauri, but it's uh, it's interesting because it's um, it have something. It's huge and it's the kind of cluster that have the typical mass the mass segregation, uh, typically in 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 huge uh, in big uh, clusters. Where do you have uh, the the biggest mass, the high mass uh, stars going to the center, and the lower mass stars going outside? Um, it's very interesting because that today we are talking about gravity is like a laboratory uh, of gravity, a cluster. Wow, this telescope looks wonderful, and. It's uh, something that um, 
that uh, have uh, um, a, um, a black hole inside. And uh, it's very interesting because as in, very, in many, many, as many, many clusters, uh, is the second one in the sky in, in the bright, the magnitude is four. And it's very, very interesting uh, because have a, a central uh, black hole or the people think that have a, a central black hole. Something incredible when you, when you watch this, this uh, kind of uh, global, um, uh, global cluster or, uh, and it's something very, very interesting. In another way, and this is was my picture of the week <laughs> from the city, from the city here in Buenos Aires. And, you know, it's, it's not easy to uh, take this kind of pictures in the city, but uh, global clusters, it's a kind of target for the people that live in the cities that uh, it's easy to have a, a great picture, um, uh, maybe with conditions uh, or light conditions, light pollution conditions that are not the best. Um, like here in my skies where I have nine, bottle nine, it's great to, to, to take these kind of pictures. Absolutely. In, yes. And in another way, um, I, I show you something that uh, I received this week um, about uh, about a new place to enjoy the sky. That it's um, uh, are, it's a, a ecological. It's a, a huge national park. Much better to explain that the name is is uh, uh, Estero de Libera. It's a huge a huge water. Uh, you know, it's like a wetlands, uh, pantanos, wetlands, but huge, huge size. Um, uh, the government of the province of Corrientes um, took the, the idea to, to choose uh, the Esteros de Libera like a, a, a special place to activities in astronomy. It's incredible because it's a place where um, where uh, you can take picture bird watching, uh, you know, um, you can you can see a lot of different animals, and in the night you have a, a great place. And let me show you again. Okay, you can see the, the light pollution map. Okay, we are starting from Buenos Aires, this terrible place. Here is where <laughs> I took the picture here in, 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 in my, my area, my town, Palermo. You can see this is my light pollution area, very polluted bottle 9.3 and maybe more. Here is Maxi. But here in this area, it's me and Nico. And the last star party in Catamarca was, let me show you, let mm. me show you, was here. Here in the north, especially this area, this place. This was the place where, where was our last surf party. Well, it's dark there. Absolutely, yes, absolutely dark. If between Argentina is, the, of course, it's an Argentina side, but very near to the to the area. To the area of of um, uh, here. Here was the place where we make the the last star party in Catamarca. 
And the another place, let me show you, totally dark, absolutely. Next year, we are um, watching uh, a place uh, with less altitude, uh, but with the same light pollution area, very, very, maybe level two or one in this area. And I'll show you, I'll show you where is the another part of the country with this area of wetlands here. Look that. Oh yeah. Yes, it's very, very dark. Super dark Only, yeah. Yes, yes. And this is very interesting because we will talking with people of uh, the, the city of Mercedes in Corrientes province. Um, we started to talk where or when we are going to make a start party. Maybe the, the, it's the best place uh, because it's, it's not so cold in winter and it's a great, a great place to go in winter, in the middle of the winter. Um, because it's in the north, it's the same like uh, you, you have the, the weather in south southern states in the United States. And uh, do you have a, a, a great and very dark place? Um, the skies are very clear in, in, in winter because uh, you have a low condition of humidity, uh, despite that they are wetlands. Um, I maybe I can show you some pictures of the place. Comparing this is the Catamarca area where we was in the last Star Paris, and in the same. This is in the in the center northwest, but or in the west, going to the Cordillera uh, with the frontier line with Chile, and. In the same, uh, in the more to the north and the northeast, do you have these wetlands that are the status of Ibera? They are very interesting to go to uh, to visit um, to have a, a great place. This is a, a, a picture to show to to, um, to to enthusiasm to the people. It's a very, very nice place, very, it's a huge uh, place full of, of uh, you know, alligators or what we call it, shakaris, um, beards, you know. And it's the typical, the typical Milky Way, very bright over, over, uh, our heads, our, our heads. And this is a, a new place to, to try to, to enjoy really. And this is um, a, a new place. And it's very interesting that the government are concerned to keep the light pollution very, very away the place. It's, it's very interesting. Um, it's something that we are going to, to prepare a new place for third parties uh in in this area hmm. that maybe we have more uh, you know uh, uh, dark areas in patagonia but sometimes the wind the time the the, the weather yeah, the wind can be very high there uh, you do you remember yes me oh, yeah, 100 100, 100. The wind. 100 there's a reason miles. why they call you 100 mile per hour caesar absolutely absolutely <laughs> and this is something that that for 2023, we are going to, 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 to um, we are going to have our um, Valle Grande Star Party in, in middle April. Uh, in October, we are going again uh, to Catamarca, uh, but maybe in July we can start uh, to have uh, the, in Corrientes province, uh maybe we, we can uh, have our first star party in the status of Ibera and Corrientes. Um, well, uh, this e next year we will we have a partial eclipse 
and we will have a, a lot, a lot of of uh, uh, activities in Argentina. And this is my, my presentation about about the all things. And as is the the last um, the last uh, show of the year, I say to the people, to my friends of Global Star Party, to have a great a great New Year, a, a Merry Christmas. Um, uh, I I sure that we will start the 2023 amazing. Thank you so much, Caesar. Uh, it's a pleasure, Scott. That's great. Okay, all right. So we are we are going to um, uh, pay a little tribute to the 50th anniversary of Apollo 17. Uh, which is actually, we're in the midst of it right now. Um, uh, you know, so uh, for those of you that uh, were, are old enough to remember this, uh, I think that uh, you, you'll um, be a little uh, um, interested in some of the new things that's going on with Apollo 17 with the unboxing of some of the samples that have been uh, in deep freeze for a long time. And um, uh, also uh, just to kind of relive that whole experience of what Apollo 17 was. Um, I, uh, you know, one, one of the things that I would like to uh, um, say again about the Astronomical League is some of the, the great speakers that they have at the Alcon events. In this last Alcon, they had Harrison Schmidt, who was... Uh, you know, really, I guess the first scientist uh, to join the Apollo uh, crew, uh, and uh, he was a geologist. Um, I got to meet him at Alcon, talk to him. He did a book signing. Uh, it was really, really great. Um, and uh, he also did an interview with us uh, that is, uh, you could still watch it on YouTube. But for right now, uh, let's go back to uh, Apollo 17 and uh, December of, uh, of 72, I believe. 10, 9, 8, 7, ignition sequence started. All engines are started. We have ignition, 2, 1, 0. We have a liftoff. We have a liftoff and it's lighting up the area. It's just like daylight here at Kennedy Space Center. The Saturn V is moving off the pad. It is now clear the tower. NASA is now celebrating the 50-year anniversary of Apollo 17. This was the final mission of the Apollo program, and most notably, the last time humans set foot on the moon's surface. The landing site in the Taurus Littrow Valley was selected so that astronauts could collect samples of the lunar highlands and investigate the volcanic history of the area. So, what was it like to actually be there, and how does this mission connect with NASA's current exploration of the moon and our future plans to return humans to the surface? These questions are best answered by the Lunar Module pilot for Apollo 17, Jack Schmidt, whose background as a geologist offers unique insight about studying the lunar terrain. For Jack, being on the moon was an unparalleled experience, and future astronauts should expect the same. The experience is going to be more than you ever anticipated, and, and, uh, and it was that way for me to get onto the moon. Uh, that uh, uh, Seeing this valley of Taurus Littrow, which is deeper than the Grand Canyon, as a matter of fact, uh, mountains to uh, six and seven thousand feet above you on either side of the valley, uh, all uh, silhouetted against a uh, uh, black sky with brilliantly illuminated mountain slopes, and the Earth, of course, uh, in one spot above uh, the southern part of the massifs. Uh, that all was a new experience, of course, and you can't. Uh, you can hear people talk about it, but you you can't absorb it until you're there. Being there is the essential human ingredient in any kind of experience of that kind. As I step off at the surface at Taurus Littrow, we'd like to dedicate the first step of Apollo 17 to all those who made it possible. Schmidt and Commander Gene Cernan completed three moonwalks on the surface, taking rock samples and deploying scientific instruments. Difficult work considering the surface gravity is only about one-sixth that of Earth's. What are you working on, Jack? Now, I bet you a dollar to donut that you don't get the TGE reading. 
Yeah, Gene, if you're uh, if it's easy enough to take it off, why don't you take it off the uh, rover and we'll try and try and level it and the stuff. Oh come on! I'm not sure there's any place to to put it on the ground level. No, you have to dig a place. Yeah, I'll do it. The conditions on the moon, however, were also ripe for the astronauts to have a little fun on the surface as well. managed to gather around 245 pounds of moon rocks and dust samples during their EVAs. It was an impressive collection for scientific analysis back on Earth. Let's see if I can't crash the uh, corner and get that contact. The quality and diversity of the Apollo sample collection is just remarkable, absolutely remarkable, and it's a gift that keeps on giving. The researchers continue to go back to these samples. New analytical technology comes along where uh, you can apply new techniques, get more higher resolution information, and that'll be going on indefinitely. I, do, I don't think the lunar sample collection from Apollo will ever be out of date. Over three decades after Apollo 17, NASA launched the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter in 2009. The scientific instruments aboard this robotic spacecraft collect a wide variety of scientific data on the Moon's environment, including surface and subsurface properties. And since LRO has now been in operation for over 13 years, it has provided a treasure trove of new information about the moon, as well as the capacity to help scientists reinterpret older data and answer scientific questions that had been lingering from the days of Apollo 17. One such case involved the debate over the origins of a light-colored mantle seen at the base of the South Massif in Taurus Littro. LRO imagery provided a key discovery that enabled scientists to put together the many pieces of the puzzle. One of the uh, high sun angle LRO photographs made it very clear that there was an, uh, an older, slightly darker avalanche underlying, partially underlying, the light colored light mantle avalanche. And that immediately brought into question whether or not the light mantle avalanche, as people had thought, it was triggered by secondary material thrown from a, the crater Tycho, some 2,000 kilometers uh, to the southwest. Uh, it would seem it, not impossible, but it would seem to be very coincidental to have two avalanches, one of which was triggered uh, by those impacts. And that in turn took us to looking at what might be an alternative uh, triggering mechanism. And uh, the more we began to understand the Lee Lincoln scarp, and that it was indeed, as a result of other LRO analyses elsewhere on the moon, uh, that it was indeed a thrust fault scarp, uh, then you start to think, well, maybe these are being triggered by seismic activity, moonquakes. And so it just, it sort of snowballs. You see one thing, and then you start to explain that, and it leads you to uh, a number of other analyses. Clearly, LRO imagery and other sensor data has made a great difference in our ability to augment the interpretation of uh, the geology of the Valley of Tars Littrell. As the LRO mission continues enhancing our ability to interpret Apollo-era data, while also collecting new information about the lunar terrain, Jack sees a clear roadmap for the future exploration of the Moon and where we should go next. It's apparent to me that uh, based on uh, uh, just general considerations as well as the magnificent imagery coming from uh, 
the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera, uh, that uh, South Pole vacant is clearly the place you'd like to have an extended human uh, presence uh, for exploration. With this, all this new knowledge, I think uh, South Pole vacant becomes a much higher priority for uh, the next human mission to the moon. Sure enough, NASA has recently announced that the Artemis missions, which will eventually have humans returning to the lunar surface, will focus on the moon's south pole. In fact, the 13 landing sites currently under consideration sit within the South Pole Aiken Basin, or on its rim. Data shows the presence of water ice in some of the permanently shadowed regions, a discovery that is crucial for understanding the geologic history of the moon, as well as helping establish a sustained human presence there in the future. Overall, the 50th anniversary of Apollo 17 reminds us that this mission was a crucial stepping stone in the history of lunar science, laying the groundwork for missions like LRO, which in turn helped open the door on a new era of human exploration with Artemis. And while these missions may be separated by decades of time, they all interconnect with the central premise and understanding of how the moon is the cornerstone to understanding our universe. The main reason the moon is important in the general understanding of the solar system is that it has no atmosphere, it's never had any water erosion, it's, it has no dynamic plates being formed and, and, uh, and eaten up as, as the earth does, uh, and it tells us what the, uh, the so early solar system was like uh, up to about uh, three and a half billion years ago. Uh, and that's information we can't really get from any other accessible planet. The Apollo 17 anniversary allows us to reflect on all the moments, big and small, that led to the success of that historic mission. For Jack, it's a time to reflect on those days, months, and years spent out in the field preparing for the duties of an astronaut. And it was during this time training that Jack learned the invaluable scientific lesson that not everything goes exactly as planned. Well, those field excursions had all of their uh... They're interesting aspects. One time, I believe it was in Nevada, uh, where getting off the rover, even without a suit, I had uh, slipped on something and fell uh, onto this uh, uh, surface. And uh, my uh, good friend, the late uh, Gordon Swan, said over the uh, communication system, well, Schmidt just hit the fan. It was, by the way, an alluvial fan. <laughs> I don't think you can use that. <laughs> I'll use that someday. That's great. Well, thank you very much, Jack. Yeah, thank you. Well, that was a great um, presentation with uh, Harrison Schmidt, uh, you know, and we want to wish him, uh, you know, a great 50th celebration, which they're currently undergoing right now. Um, we are... Um, uh, ready to turn this over to Frank Marches. Um, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, Frank. But uh, uh, we did meet at the um, we did meet at the uh, USS Hornet. Um, uh, th that's now been a couple of years ago, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, it was fantastic. You know, I got to see the Unistellar in, in action uh, as you were demonstrating it to. Uh, to a star party that we had going on up there on, on the deck of that historic uh, ship. And um, so that was, that was totally cool. I, uh, you know, I'm very happy to, you know, we made an announcement that we are a distributor for Unistellar at this point. Uh, I did um, bring a couple here. I know that you're at a, a scientific symposium right now. And, uh, Yes. So, but uh, so you don't have scopes with you, um, but I thought that I could, uh, you know, certainly bring um, uh, one with me here, and you know, so I've I've got uh, we've got both models here, uh, but uh, you're you're the one to give this presentation. But before you do, Frank, um, maybe you could give us a little bit of background, more background about yourself. I know that you work at SETI. I know that you're. Uh, you know, one of the lead astronomers there, maybe the senior astronomer at SETI. Uh, um, you know, my, my uh, association with SETI goes uh, back maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 years, something like that, where I got to meet uh, Seth Shostak and Frank Drake a couple of occasions. Um, 
And uh, so it's just a, uh, you know, an incredible organization. And, um, you know, I know that the fight for money there and, and to keep on doing the research, the important research that you guys do at SETI is, is uh, uh, always uh, something, you know, that is a, uh, a bit of a struggle. But I think that you have some good endowments and stuff now that are keeping uh, SETI alive and well. And I'm very impressed with uh, uh, the Unistellar product. Uh, I've used it myself, um, made some nice astro photographs with it. Our team here at Explore Scientific is, you know, they're all like lined up, you know, wanting to take turns in using the Unistellar. Um, but uh, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps you can give us a little bit more, uh, you know, of your inspiration to get involved into astronomy. What's your and to tell us your story of your involvement with Unistellar and then maybe give a little yeah. presentation. So thanks for coming on on your busy schedule. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm in uh, Baltimore right now and uh, STSCI. Huh? Can you hear me well? Because yes, I, I can. I'm not using my... Oh, yes, cool. yes. Um, Wonderful. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm at the first uh, science result conference with JWST and I'm telling you it's extraordinary what JWST can do. And there is a lot of things we cannot talk about, unfortunately, but you're going to see there is some amazing result that's coming, going to come out in the next two, three months with this uh, space telescope. But yeah, uh, uh, so I'm an, astro I'm an astronomer. Uh, that's really my my brand, my my passion. Been always a professional astronomer working on adaptive optics with uh, ground-based telescopes uh, initially. Uh, using a 10, 10 meter class telescope, developing instruments uh, to uh, characterize asteroids, find moons around asteroids, uh, study the atmosphere of Jupiter, and um, as well uh, search for exoplanets by direct imaging. So I'm being involved in projects like GPI, the Gemini Planet Imager in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, using the Gemini South Telescope. And um, yeah, I've been uh, working a lot on outreach at the SETI Institute because, as you mentioned, uh, SETI Institute is a non-profit organization, and we are um, more than just doing astronomy or searching for aliens, which is people know us for. We are also connecting with the with people. Uh, we're trying to bring the passion, the passion, and the fun of astronomy to people, as uh, kind of our father, Carl Sagan, Carl Sagan did. Uh, we're trying to renew the astronomy regularly, bring the bring the astronomy and planetary science to the uh, to the youth in particular. So in 2017, um, I met this team of uh, uh, three French people, um, scientists as well, mm -hmm. who had this uh, idea of creating a telescope for everybody, and that's the Unistellar telescope that you have behind you. It became mm -hmm. from a fun idea in 2017 to a demonstrator that I, I show around uh, and we met <laughs> when I yes. had this one. <laughs> you probably remember this one. I do. <laughs> I do. He was now, well, I have both. I have both models here. I, I didn't yeah. didn't have room to uh, to set it up by my desk, but you know I certainly have the unit that has the uh, eyepiece, the eyepiece. Mm -hmm. right? And this is an icon eyepiece. Very nice. Um, and, uh, you know, the, gosh, the design of the telescope is really just extraordinary. Uh, you know, I've been working on telescopes for a long time myself, but it's like you thought of everything, you know, even built into the lens cap is a nice batten off mask for focusing, you know, focusing is done from the back of the instrument. Um, uh, all the parts are very precision, uh, which is, you know, nice to, uh, Really nice to see. So just a, a great job in the idea of it, the engineering of it, and the execution of it, which is really, really important. Uh, you know, and the, this is not, uh, you know, when you when you hold a Unistellar, you know, you know that it's it's uh, it's definitely made from the right materials and all the mm -hmm. rest of it. So, you know, just a but a very elegant. Telescope yeah, the, and uh, and the whole experience of using it is also very elegant, you know. So, yeah, the idea is really to make ac astronomy accessible uh, by building an instrument that people want to use, want to show around, uh, kind of connect with it, like an iPhone. 
Yes. You use your phone all the time. It's slick design. It's simple. You have cables around. You want your phone, if you have it, you turn it on, it works. That's what we wanted to do with the Unistella EV scope. And uh, I hope we succeed in. So that's uh, 2017, 2019. We did a Kickstarter that probably people have heard about. And we are very, we were very impressed by the the amount of people who uh, who went to 2017, we did the Kickstarter. So end of 2017, a lot of people basically purchased a telescope that did not exist on Kickstarter. And in 2019, we delivered the first one, and now we have them in stores everywhere. It's uh, it's the largest tele network of telescope in the world, and that's what I'm going to talk about. In fact, in my presentation. Okay. And it's a. I just want to mention again, it's more than a telescope. It's a network. It's a community of people working together to do science. It's a community of people who, who share, share the, the wonder of the universe and want to, uh, to participate to scientific investigation. So if you want, I can show a few slides yeah, please. that I prepare. Please. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, I and I, I, will, I will also add that, you know, to get involved in, uh, uh, you know, the science part of astronomy, was not always easy to do. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there, there have been, you know, since I've been an amateur astronomer, I've seen, I've started to see more and more pro am, you know, professional slash amateur efforts and stuff like that. But it's nice to see something where, you know, if you want to jump in and you want to be part of the, you know, the scientific community, uh, you can do it with, um, you know, really what would for many be their first telescope. And that that is amazing, that that is unprecedented in our industry. Good. So yeah, I gave basically the introduction. I just want to mention that this is not a work I do by myself. We have a team. Uh, we have a fifty-ish uh, people working in France on the telescope itself, the the manufacturing, the development of the technology, and so on. And in the US, in San Francisco, I have a team of 10 people, uh, astronomers, professional astronomers as well, working together on using this network to do a meaningful scientific investigation. So those are the name of them. Tom Esposito, Lawrence Groh, Ryan Lambert, Ariel Kulikowski, Paul Dalba, Joey, uh, Guillaume Blaca, et cetera. So those are very, the, they are the ones who are doing, working days and nights to make sure that people get the data when they observe quickly, developing cutting edge algorithm to increase the, the scientific return of the telescope. So you mentioned the telescope. I'm just gonna say again that we have, we have this is the, we have three types of telescope. We starting with the Viscope one in 2019. Then we had the Equinox, which is the one you have on the, on the, on the mount right now <laughs> behind mm -hmm. you. And then we have right now the Viscope two, which is the telescope we developed in partnership with Nikon, uh, which has an eyepiece, a very high quality icon, uh, a Nikon eyepiece. So it's a cool consumer product. It's a product that we want people to use. Okay, It's also a telescope that is used in education um, because it helps you to find stars, <laughs> to find information about the object you're observing. So if you're an educator, you can share with your students the use of the telescope. Multiple people can be connected around the telescope and watch their, their phone, what the telescope is doing. So that's really to create this education community as well. And then that's what I want to talk about today. It's a useful telescope for scientific investigation. And that's something that we started right at the beginning. In 2017, we were already talking about doing scientific investigation with the telescope. So those are the characteristics of the Viscope 1 and the Equinox. Uh, you have one behind you. I'm not going to go through the details, but the goal here is to make a, a system which is a digital smart robotic telescope capable of uh, collecting uh, photons so you can see in color galaxy and nebulae. We have an algorithm behind that process the data, remove the atmospheric turbulence, uh, remove the um, the atmospheric pollution, for instance, uh, increase the image quality so you can see the nebulae gal and galaxies or comets in color. And then we have a telescope which is portable. And that's very important for us to have a telescope that you can carry around in a backpack. So if you want to do scientific expedition, if you want to 
if you want to take it with you when you go for uh, in the outdoor in camp camping with your friends or family it takes five seconds you put in the backpack it's ready you can go and it works on the battery so you don't need powers etc it's self-autonomous you don't need internet to use this telescope so people collect data observations of whatever they want but we can also send them alerts to observe scientific uh, in scientific um, project be part of scientific project the data then uploaded into the unistellar cloud server through, through the wi-fi and the city institute the scientific partner have access to this data and we do that analysis in real time of the data coming from those telescopes so people have seen picture but i'm going to show some of them those are real observations taken by observers uh, around the world um you see the triangulum galaxy the comet neowise comet here uh you can you can observe as i mentioned in color can you hear me because my yes my, yeah all right for some reason my screen's froze okay um, now you're fine i'm fine yeah right, let's do that again yeah so this is the uh, elix nebula etc so we have seen those pictures i'm not gonna go through that in details but you can see the quality of the observation you get with the telescope in a few minutes um here's 34 minutes for the elix for instance here and 30 minutes for this one so the goal is really to make ac uh, astronomy accessible so people can observe and enjoy the dark sky from their home. <laughs> so it did work. And we can I can say that because now we have 10,000 telescopes around the world. And this map is not complete, in fact. There is way more now. Uh, we started, in, of course, in Europe, United States, and Japan. We extended in, in the Australia, New Zealand last year. And now we have distributors everywhere in the world, in India, in China, uh, in South America, um, and we have telescopes in Africa, in various places in Africa. So among these 10,000 EVSCOPE users, 1,200 of them sign up to become citizen astronomers. So it means that they participate to our citizen science and they get access to the Slack. That's the way we communicate with them. So they know what to observe looking at the slack or by simply looking at the website we have a website that we update almost on a daily basis so they know if something happened in the sky so those people those citizen astronomers are a very broad and diverse group of people so we have people living in cities that like want to show stars to the kids uh schools uh we have amateur astronomers who have telescope in the past and choose our digital technology because it's simpler for them we have people who love the outdoor and take the telescope with them when they go hiking or camping uh we have techies just the beauty of using a telescope which is a robotic telescope and we have scientists uh, I have a lot of my colleagues in fact who bought the telescope and I will, I will confess that I've been using, I've been observing more since I have an unistellar eviscope myself that, than that when I was a, a, only a professional astronomer. Hmm. I'd use teles my telescope almost three times a week now when it's nice in San Francisco uh, to just observe for fun or to do some tests, but I do take my telescope out. When I was a professional astronomer and I had, I had to request time on the Keck or the VLT, I was observing twice per year max. Here I'm talking right. about observing often. And I know the constellations now. <laughs> because that's when you do it, that you finally learn the constellation, that you recognize them. Um, and then we have VIPs, people like uh, our famous Tuvok from, from Star Trek, uh, Tim Russ, has one of mm -hmm. our telescopes and use it a lot. So the, wonderf the idea here is really that Unistellar developed the telescope and the technology. SETI Institute is the nonprofit organization, which is partner, and we develop scientific projects for the Unistellar Eviscope with partners. Uh, so we have the Minor Planet Center, we have NASA TESS, uh, we uh, became officially a, a partner of NASA uh, a few months ago uh, to do follow up of uh, TESS, the mission that, observe, that search for exoplanets. Of, of NASA to do follow up of those observations. And we have other partners such as AVSO, IOTA, the Lucy Mission, and in, in Europe, the Observatoire de Paris and Charles University. 
so we um, we have multiple scientific campaigns of themes that we've developed. I'm not going to talk about all of them. Uh, we have planetary defense, which is consists basically of sending an alert every time an asteroid passes nearby our planet, and we want to refine the orbit of this asteroid by doing uh, obs continuous observation. So we mm -hmm. use the rotation of our planet and the fact we have a network all around the world to continuously observe an asteroid. So to refine its orbit, we send the data to MPC and the orbit is regularly every hour update, updated. So we have done that for multiple near Earth asteroid and uh, we have developed an algorithm that also create the 3D shape model of the asteroid from the light curve, from the variation oh, of cool. light. That's, That's what cool. you have here. 1999 AP10 was the first attempt we did last year, and now we have much more of them. We do occultations. So those are, this I love though. I love this project because we call the, the, our citizens remember doing this, the shadow hunters. So what they do, they travel in different places to look for a star. We predict when the star will be occulted by the passage of, a, of an asteroid between us and the star. So if you're located underneath the shadow of this asteroid, you will see the star disappearing for a few seconds. And from that, by combining multiple observations, we derive the shape of the asteroid. So we have done this for thousands of, of occultation last year. And I think this year we can probably reach 2000. And we have significant result as well that I'm gonna show briefly. And then something that really interests people, and I'm I'm still amazed when I say that we can do that from with this tiny telescope. Right. <laughs> we, can, we can now. It's a four and a half inch planet. telescope, but it's it <laughs> it is really uh, you know it is really what um, you know the application of, yeah. of using something like this and having you know an extremely sensitive sensor, um, you know, and being able to work all that to produce sciences, um, I think most people would not think that this is possible, but in fact, uh, there, this is definitely within the range of this aperture. And, uh, um, you know, I think that people that get involved with, uh, you know, and do science like this will feel a great amount of satisfaction and gratification. Yeah. Yes. So I'm going to show a few more detailed example, like for occultation. So for instance, we have like, Every month, we, we calculate all the occultation observable on our planet. And we select some of them, not all of them. And those are the path of the occultation okay, around the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if you are a user, even if you don't have a unistellar telescope, you can basically go on our website to find what occultation is visible from your area. And you can observe it. If you have a unistellar telescope, you find the path. And we also give you a link. You click on the link, and this will basically send the telescope to the right location, and you can start observing the occultation when it's re when, it, when when you are ready. So we we're really trying to make this extremely simple. You don't need to know anything about uh, right ascension, declination. You don't need to know much more than what we tell you to do. And of course, you can change those parameters. You can do your own science later on, but it's good for the people to start with something very simple, and they understand through the apps and through our website, what's happening in real time. So those are some occultation we done uh, in 2021. I'm not gonna go through them, all of them. I think I have a slide showing some, some of the missions. Um, we have been focusing on the Trojan asteroid, which are this kind of population which has been forgotten because we discovered the Kuiper Belt objects in the 90s. So we went from the main belt, the Kuiper Belt, and forgot about the Trojan, which are those asteroids locating at the same distance than Jupiter and orbiting uh, in front and behind Jupiter orbit, basically. Um, they are interesting population and NASA is really interesting in them now because we think they are kind of the, the most primitive bodies in our uh, solar system, close, accessible to us. So we do occultation, we focus our occultation program on those Trojans because they, we don't know anything about them. And here are some pictures we took over the past uh, six months of some missions that we did. 
I love occultation because there is always a story. You like in the case of Colorado here, uh, I met uh, those citizen astronomers and I never met them before. We bas I basically sent them a message saying there is an occultation by the asteroid Didymos observable north of Denver. And uh, seven of them answered to me and said, hey, we want to do that. So we met in the middle of the night in the um, uh, abandoned airport parking lot and discussed. I showed them how it works and we all scattered along a road to do the observation. And um, we did not catch this occultation, but people who were located 400 meters uh, further in the east saw it uh, using the, uh, from the IOTA network. So this is a kind of things we do as well. It's like, as I say, it's not only a telescope, it's a community of fun people who wants to do meaningful science and, uh, and participate to, uh, to this. Um, we, um, we also did mission like this outside United States. So we have multiple mission. This is one of the most successful one that we did very early in 2019. We were the first one to detect an occultation by uh, by this asteroid of, of, of the Lucy mission, um, Ohus. And you can see it disappearing here. It's very small. So we sent in this, at this location, our CEO at the time, Laurent, and our president, uh, Arnaud, who is here. <laughs> and, uh, and they observed the occultation, they succeeded, they succeeded in observing it. And here we have Alexis, uh, uh, engineer at Unistella who tried to observe it with uh, uh, some local people as well, and he did not see it. So this is a very, it's an adventure again. Uh, we send he, here, it's in Oman, a country uh, that you don't have, you don't often go. It gives you a reason to go to visit some kind of interesting places in the world if you are a shadow hunter with the Unistella Reviscope. Um, yes, yeah, so... The second part is really the, I just want to briefly mention that exoplanet transits, as I say, is really like the revolution. We can now detect with this telescope, Jupiter-sized exoplanet transiting uh, solar sun, sun like stars. And uh, in fact, we found a lot of those. Uh, tests found, I think the last number I, see, I, I saw is like 460 exoplanets like that, that need to be confirmed by the, by uh, additional techniques. Because when NAS tests detect an occultation, uh, a transit, sorry, the test cannot go back to the, to the target often to observe it. Tests move and observe another field of view. So we rely on other instruments to confirm this, uh, this transit. So that's what we do with the Unistellar network. We calculate when those transits will be visible from different area and we send maps to our uh, observers and they participate to that. And we got, I think last time I looked, there was 1,000 uh, transiting exoplanet detected with the Unistellar network. It's enormous. And with that, we refine the orbit where we first we confirm the existence of this exoplanet, and then we, conf we refine the orbit of this exoplanet. And now we're really trying to do some very cool things like uh, uh, we combine the data coming from multiple telescopes, like you can see here, and with this, we have a much better light curve, much, ref, much, much better quality in terms of signal to noise. So a better estimate of the timing of the transit. Or we also combine observation from multiple locations. Like here we have two observers, uh, Bruno in Caen and Justus in Georgia and United States. They, Bruno observed at the beginning, then send a message to uh, Justus and Justus took over and you have a pro you have a profile of an occultation. If we didn't have these two observers located apart, mm -hmm. this will not have been possible. And now we do even more fun stuff. Like we are we observe occultation a transit for which we have an uncertainty of 12, 24 hours. So we observe continuously for 36 hours, and we analyze the data and we detected recently a uh, uh, transit that lasted 12 hours. The longest transiting exoplanet ever seen from the ground was detected with the Unistellar network. And this is because of the power of the community and the fact that we are distributed all around the planet. We are capable of doing these kind of observations that is not possible with professional telescopes. Amazing. So, 
And now we also do, we also try to connect the people to what's going on in space. So we've, uh, when they launched JWST in December last year, we basically have our observer that observed JWST on its way to the Lagrange point. So we saw the separation by the booster. Uh, we saw some flare due to some change of orientation of the, of the spacecraft. We saw the opening of this, the spacecraft. I don't, I don't think I have this, but we see a light. We have a light curve. We clearly show that the, the brightness, the increase of brightness of the spacecraft due to the fact that it was opening its primary and its sun shield. And we have this data being published and those citizen astronomers who observe it, there is like 50, 50 of them roughly, they basically uh, uh, are co-author of this paper. And that's an important point that I want to mention. The, if you are big, uh, if you part, part of our network, you're part of the network as an observer, but also if you want, you can also participate to the data processing, the analysis and the writing of the paper. We, trans we do that transparently. We give the opportunity to our uh, citizen astronomers to participate to the pro entire process, to be part of the scientific process as well. And then when the paper is published, they co-author like any astronomer, professional, amateur, citizen astronomer, it doesn't matter to us. You are astronomer, you spend some night observing, you took some data, you process them, some of them maybe, you're part of the, of the paper. And I think it's important that we're not only using the time of people, we're involving our, our community in the scientific process. This is where they learn, and then they start doing their own thing. In fact, that we have now astronomers, citizen astronomers who are developing their own program. Justus goes by himself to the list of uh, test objects of interest and by himself decide what he will observe uh, overnight and sometimes send these requests to observers around the world. So they're doing their own science. Right. And that's really good for us. We don't need to be involved in everything. There is enough bodies to observe in the solar system and elsewhere. So I'm glad that to see that they learn and they're now doing their own. So fantastic. Oh yeah. We need a cake too. I just wanted to show that people have, <laughs> we, we basically order a cake in the shape of JWST. And this was kind of a token, a present for the, the team in Marseille who helped uh, significantly in developing I love it. project. <laughs> That's great. Uh, there are uh, a couple of questions. Uh, um, I, I, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've got uh, 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 Sentil Nagapan watching on YouTube, and um, uh, he... Um, he lives in very light polluted skies. Now, mm -hmm. I know that you're in the Bay Area, so you also have light polluted skies too. He is in Bortle 8 skies. Uh, he, he says um, uh, that he is getting, uh, he said, I can, barely, I can barely see anything looking up at the sky, but it still picks up and does an amazing job. Um, uh, but he's wondering, is, uh, is it possible to put a light pollution filter or some sort of filter onto the unistellar uh, yes. telescope? Yes, I, did, I released a video, it's on my personal YouTube page, mm -hmm. of uh, explaining how you can set up uh, filters in front of your telescope. So if you want to reduce, for instance, the light pollution to get uh, to see nebulae, uh, in color faster. So that's possible. You can, um, it's also on the Unistellar page, but it's, I can send you the link, but by Google simply Unistellar filter and my name, and you will probably get right away with my YouTube video okay. with all the references to explaining how to do that. All right, great, great. Um, he said he was hesitant to get a filter because he didn't want to cause any damage to the equipment. Yeah, I it's tricky. That, that, it's, I mean, it's the, tricky the, to set it up. I, I will but, tell you, I mean, honest with you, Frank, we have dropped one of these telescopes twice and it's still working, okay? Uh, <laughs> once we, it fell out of my truck because somebody pushed a bunch of equipment uh, and, um, and then one of our customer service reps uh, accidentally dropped. She, she was devastated. She was super scared because... Uh, 
that she had dropped one of these instruments, but in fact, uh, there was really nothing wrong with the instrument at all. Um, and so that, that is, uh, if you're worried about uh, working with the telescope, uh, you know, I would just make sure, uh, you know, before you attach a filter, uh, watch, watch Frank's video, okay? Yep. Uh, get whatever adapter that you might need. And then, um, you know, I imagine it takes the inch and a quarter size uh, filters that would screw in front of the, uh, in front of the sensor and, uh, you're not going to damage it, so it's, no. I, I would be, uh, I would not uh, be so, uh, you know, scared uh, about uh, working with with that telescope. Um, I have a personal question too. Uh, I've worked with um, uh, our own team uh, that does photo, you know, photometry and exoplanet work, and they use a diffuser mounted in a one and a quarter mm -hmm. inch. Uh, Filter cell is. Do you think it will be possible to to use the diffuser method with a unistellar? I tried that. And in fact, that's one of the things I tried a long time ago. I think a year ago with some professional astronomers, mm -hmm. and uh, we didn't get such a good result in comparison to uh, uh, not having a diffuser. I see. Um, because it killed the scintillation. That's true. But then it's also uh, increased the shape of the. It increased the 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 profile in size yes. so at the end we don't get we don't we, we didn't win that much plus the issue is that we could not find a, a diffuser that will allow us to be able to do the alignment at the time ah the right diffuser was either too big so we could not see any any star so we have to set up the telescope when it was already aligned and that's not something i really like doing because then you sure. have to be with position it. and so so it's possible but we did not find yet the best uh, diffuser for, for the unistellar scope. I see. Okay. Great. Um, well, this is well, wonderful, Frank. I'm just going to finish by showing some cool things we have done with, uh, okay. with Daniel. Like, this is like uh, observing the International Space Station passing in front of the, of the moon, transiting the moon. And uh, we also went to, uh, in California to Vandenberg. And we uh, we watched the takeoff of the of the SpaceX was SpaceX rocket from five miles away with the Unistellar network and then the Unistellar telescope. That's cool. That's great. That, yeah, that's we can do stuff like that with the telescope as well. I mean, there is an infinite amount of pot pot possibilities of things we can observe. There is like ten thousand objects observable with the scope in the sky, but you can also observe some cool things like a rocket taking off and then the separation of this rocket and even the satellite being uh, ejected from the fair, from the from the top of the rocket. We have done we have people observing the uh, the International Space Station and the Dragon capsule together, etc. So they, there is some very cool things we can do now. There's so much happening in the sky, in this in space, in orbit around Earth and beyond that uh, you will use the telescope every day. Um, last, um, uh, last uh, well, uh, no, last week, this week, I'm, I'm confused because I've been traveling, but last week, uh, mm -hmm. our citizen astronomers observed Artemis coming back. We have like videos of Artemis oh, wow. on the way back and observe, we do observe Artemis and we refine the orbit, for instance. We can even see the, the change of trajectory uh, due to, um, to some maneuvers uh, just before Artemis reached the atmosphere of our planet. See, so this you is will... one of the one of the things that's very the the portability of this instrument to be able to go and set up quickly and get something like this done is is um, you know is great because the, this these kinds of projects that you're talking about usually could only be done by someone that's extremely experienced, right? Yeah. And, uh, and, and, you know, they have like almost muscle memory with their telescope equipment and stuff. And uh, the, the, uh, the Unistellar takes that load off their shoulders, you know, and makes it possible to dive right in and start doing this stuff. Yeah, being able to, I mean, it happens to me a lot that I'm watching something on TV and then I look outside and say, oh, it's clear. You know, San Francisco, yeah. not having fog, it's already a right. record, okay? <laughs> So I, I go, I basically go out and just set up my telescope and observe in five minutes. I'm ready. 
I don't, it's not a big production. It's really an object which is now in my house that I use, as I've mentioned multiple times, because it's easy to use. And, right. and that's really, that was the key part. We, we have people who have done competition of how quickly they observe, they can set up the telescope and put it on the sky. And I think it was two minutes and 30 seconds. That's fast. Yeah, that's that fast. is fast. Yeah. Frank, I have a, an, another question for you. Go ahead. Uh, you know, the small size and really, I mean, when, when you, you know, I always admire great build in a telescope and this does have great build. It really does. Uh, the tripod itself, when I first looked at it, I go, gosh, you know, is the tripod any good? This, this was a question I had. And, you know, as soon as I started separating out the legs, I could feel that this was extremely well made. I knew it was going to be really, really steady. You know, the, the capture of the uh, mount inside the tripod, also very nice. This is, this is something that, uh, that you see in the movie industry to put heavy cameras on, right? And right. so... This is a quick release, quick assembly, um, you know, uh, really, you know, top notch all the way around. Um, but I, I, the question I have for you, Frank, is how does it perform in the wind? Uh, we're doing a long exposure where yeah. we do the immense vision and there is no way you can basically compensate for the wind if you do long exposure. So mm. the wind is, a, is an issue if you want to do beautiful pictures. If you want to do science such as uh, occultations and so on, yes. it's not such a big deal. So we always recommend- I mean, the, the telescope the behind, behind, behind me with the Unistellar, I've got this Dobsonian, uh, it's like a wind sail, you know? I mean, when, when there's wind, you, you can forget it, you know? Um, if, if it's very windy, I would think that the smaller Unistellar and its sturdiness Actually, it would be a, an advantage in the wind. Yeah, we. Uh, I mean, I observe multiple times with wind in windy condition, and I just put the the, the tripod quite low, and yes. I park my car in a such a way that it protects so the block from the wind. Right. I don't. Yeah. It's not like it's not a wind sail. It's it's not working when it's exposed full in the wind. Whether sure. like any telescopes is like that, of course. I don't have really much point of reference to to talk about small telescope. In fact, because I don't, I did not really use telescopes in the windy condition. Mm. What I know is that I can always find a way to make my telescope work if I just protect it from in from the wind through an object uh, using a wall. You orient the telescope in the right way. Yes. Mm. I'm just gonna finish by saying that we have ton of other things coming. The, the telescope is one part, the software is another part. Mm -hmm. We update the software regularly. Every three months, we release a major uh, major feature. Um, we released this month, uh, last month, for instance, observation of planets, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, Venus, and Mars, using a different type of technology. It's still the NN's vision, but we use what we call lucky imaging to do very short exposure. And we analyze this, those exposure, and we keep only the good image, freezing the seeing. Mm -hmm. And we get an image of, uh, of Jupiter, which is below the resolution of the theoretical resolution of the telescope and the atmosphere. And that's a lot of people to see band belts, the red giant spot on Jupiter, for instance. So we improve that every, the software every three months. We add new features. We improve the image quality. That's great. Uh, we, ha we have uh, an official release. It's already in the app, but it's kind of hidden of uh, the transient mode uh, in science. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a mode. We, uh, we have developed an algorithm at the science team in California here where we uh, analyze all these alerts coming from the ZTF survey and other surveys. And if something happens, something interesting happens, like a supernovae that could be observable with the Unistellar network, you're mm -hmm. gonna get an alert on your phone telling you that there is something come, there is something interesting to observe. The goal is to get that 30 seconds after the discovery of the object. Oh wow! Okay. And you observe it, and maybe you will be the first person to see a supernovae. Yeah, that's cool. That's <laughs> that's, that's cool. cool. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> and, and then we're doing the cometary activities, gonna come uh, probably next year. 
we fo do follow up of comets activity over time. We get the shape, the 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 structure, the light curve, uh, detection of jets, etc. We can we're gonna be also able to alert our users if a comet is disintegrating, for instance. Mm -hmm. Boom! We send an alert to you. You're observing to this night, and you will know right away there is this comet disintegrating, and you may be the first person to observe it with the Unistellar network. Wow. Etc. We're gonna do like we're gonna do fun science uh, uh, in the next uh, six months a year. We got a grant from the Moore and got Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation for that. Uh, mm -hmm. We're gonna do easy science, make it even easier for people to participate to uh, scientific investigation. And we have ton of other project partnership with space agencies around the world, private companies as well, to part to do some follow up of satellites activity constellations, for instance. So yeah, if you uh, if people watching us right now is in, are interesting, they can join our just visit our website, our social media, uh, to find out what we do, and uh, maybe one day purchase uh, a unistellar telescope or and join the network. Everybody is welcome. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, you know, it, it really, it, it's a brave new world that uh, you're taking on uh, to you know, massively bring in people into science in this way. And, um, you know, you too can be involved in this. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I know with Frank and their science team there uh, backing all this, that uh, you will have a very positive experience. Um, uh, Thank you. The young, the, the Sintel is also asking, how good is this to be carried in an airplane? I. And it's so rugged, uh, it fits in the backpack. Um, have you carried his uh, uh, carry-on luggage before, Frank? All the time. All the time. <laughs> so there is, values, there is various way of doing it, okay? So yeah. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna say the way I do it. If I go with an airline that I like and they know me because I travel a lot with them, yeah, I come with my backpack and yeah. I say, this is a, an instrument. Okay, a musical yeah. instrument and a telescope, a company has to let you go in the airplane with it. Awesome. Some company will do it. I'm not going to say the names, but uh, it, it starts with a D. They will always <laughs> let me <laughs> let me take my airplane, <laughs> my, my telescope. Great. Uh, and then the um, and if uh, if I travel with a company, I don't I'm not sure it's international. There is more restriction international flight. Then I I bought this Pelican case. I can give you a reference mm -hmm. here, right? And uh, and it's perfect. It fits perfectly. You can put the telescope, the the mount, close it. You put a few a few flyers or description of the telescope so the, because yeah. they will open it they always open pelican cases sure. and it's good i flew with this in australia in namibia in japan in i took plenty of flights with my telescope that sounds fact, great they know me for the, for my telescope at the airport <laughs> right right well wonderful well thank right. you thank you for uh, being a part of our this is our final global star party event of this year we'll start again uh, in January, and I'll check in with you regularly, Frank, on uh, the science front there, and uh, if there's anything that we can do uh, here at Explore Scientific to increase that, you know, I'd be really interested to talk to you about that, so. Okay, yeah, we'll be, uh, we'll come back one day to give maybe, when we have a very cool result, I will show you some of the very cool results we get at the tele Awesome. Tele I look right. forward to it, Frank. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Okay, um, well, I hope that all of you enjoyed the 109th Global Star Party. Uh, again, uh, you know, I wanted to uh, thank all of the presenters uh, that were on tonight. Uh, we had, um, uh, of course, David Levy, uh, uh, John Goss from the Astronomical League, um, uh, David Eicher, Editor-in-Chief of Astronomy Magazine, uh, Maxi Folares down in Argentina, uh, showing us his astrophotography uh, work. Um, Adrian Bradley chasing uh, dark skies in his nightscape images. 
uh, Don Davies from the uh, CTIO, live from Chile. Um, uh, you know, so that was uh, uh, from the four meter Blanco telescope control room. Uh, very interesting. Uh, Fraser Kane from Universe Today was on. We want to thank him. Marcello Souza, uh, editor of Skies Up magazine. And, uh, you know, uh, he did not, I, I don't think that he had much time to talk about the 15th uh, 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 event that he'll be putting on, but uh, it is the astronomical and aeronautical uh, event. And so you'll be hearing more about that. Caesar Brollo was on with Caesar's Universe. And, uh, you know, congratulations again to Harrison Schmidt uh, uh, and, uh, you know, the all the people that uh, are still around for that uh, put together the Apollo 17, uh, you know, uh, launch to the moon. Um, and lastly, lastly, uh, Frank Marches uh, for uh, uh, you know, talking to us about Unistellar and the science behind it. And so that was so cool. Uh, I've got like a couple of more videos to show you and then we're gonna call it a night. But uh, again, thank you very much. And uh, we will be um, encouraging, you, encouraging you to keep looking up. So take care. So we received samples from the Apollo 17 mission, which were returned to Earth in December of 1972, so nearly 50 years ago. They said they collected on the moon, brought back, then they were frozen within about a month of being returned. So no one's ever looked at them since. It's very exciting. A curation facility at NASA Johnson Space Center sent us the samples and they did have to do some special efforts to keep them cold because we wanted them to stay frozen. So they had a special cold shipping box with panels that were frozen in a very cold freezer and a chunk of dry ice. We picked it up from the receiving office here at Goddard, opened it up, pulled the samples out, and stuck them straight in our freezer and locked them up safely. So these uh, frozen samples were actually collected from a region on the moon that was in shadow from the sun. So it was basically a large boulder. In the near future, we're going back to the moon and hopefully going to the polar regions of the moon where some of these regions are in permanent shadow and they don't see the sun, you know, they're cold. These particular samples are really great analogs for what we might expect to see in the polar regions when we go back. So we actually started last week to process the samples. So the samples we got are basically dirt, lunar dirt, and we basically made moon tea out of them. So moon tea is what we call it when we pull out the soluble compounds from the soil. And so we basically take the lunar sample, seal it up with a torch and a little glass test tube full of water, stick it in an oven overnight and boil it, and we're just pulling out those soluble compounds that we care about, the same way you'd make tea with boiling water at home. What we're trying to do is answer some questions about the history of this sample experience at the surface of the moon. The surface of the moon is a really hostile environment. You know, it's not like here on Earth where we have this beautiful atmosphere that protects us from the nasties of space. So we have particles from the sun that are continuously hitting the surface of the moon and we've got galactic cosmic rays that are coming in and penetrating into the surface as well. So they actually create uh, noble gases in these particles. So you can imagine that there's none to begin with and then as they get exposed to this space environment they kind of get more and more build up of noble gases. And our technique is to actually unlock those noble gases from the sample and measure them so we can come up with what we call a cosmic ray exposure age. So it's basically how long this sample has been sat at the surface being exposed, so basically getting a space tan. Say 50 years ago, this same technique, which is called a noble gas mass spectrometry, would probably need anywhere, you know, tens to hundreds of milligrams to do the same thing that we now do with a couple milligrams. It's really special to be part of this, and particularly because I can look back at the papers and the, the processes that the Curation Office and the scientists in the 1970s thought about, and they put so much care into preserving these samples for future science, to making sure that they were gonna be at their, you know, the best condition so that as we develop new techniques, we're able to go and look at these samples and get new answers to the science questions that were being asked. 
you know, I'm still studying these samples 50 years later of, for the, from the Apollo mission, the original Apollo missions. And, you know, you don't know what's going to be in another 50 years, but I'm still a part of the Apollo dream of going to the moon and bringing samples back. <laughs> so the fact that we have Artemis now is amazing. Like having our own Artemis generation is really exciting. I just can't wait to see people go back to the moon. Hi everybody, it's Mike Hatch with Explore Scientific. Today we're going to show you exactly how to collimate your refractor telescope. What you're going to need is a Cheshire eyepiece, a hex wrench, and a flashlight. So collimation is the alignment of the lens cell on the end of your telescope. The lens cell is what's holding those optics in, so you want to make sure those are aligned and centered to give you the best performance out of your telescope. Now looking at our board here, we've got two examples. One of a collimated telescope and one that is out of collimation. By looking through your Cheshire eyepiece, you're going to be able to see crosshairs or circles depending on the design of your Cheshire. A collimated telescope is going to have one solid crosshair right in the middle of that lens cell. An out of collimation telescope, you're going to see multiple crosshairs that are out of the center. Your goal is to bring those crosshairs into the center to create one bold crosshair. So this is our Cheshire eyepiece. And you can find these across the web and order one at any range of price. Now, you will install this into the back of your telescope into the focuser. You're then going to snug your tensioned collar to hold this in place and you want to make sure that it's nice and flush against the end of that focuser to ensure an accurate collimation reading. Once it's installed in the back of the focuser, you're going to take your flashlight and shine it right through the top of that opening, like so. There's then going to be a peephole in the back of the Cheshire, and that's how you will view the position of your collimation. Now to understand the front of your telescope a little bit better, you will see three to four groupings of two screws around the front of your lens cell. One is your adjusting screw, and one is your locking screw. The one on the right is your locking screw, and you'll see that it's sticking out a little bit farther than the adjusting screw. Now to start your collimation process, you're going to loosen this locking screw very slightly, anywhere from a quarter to half a turn. Then you will then be able to adjust your adjusting screw to achieve perfect collimation. Here we have two examples, one of a collimated lens cell and one that is out of collimation. The collimated lens cell, you can see there's one solid crosshair in the center of the optics. The out of collimation, you will see anywhere from two to three crosshairs that are out of place, not in the center. So our goal is to bring those in and stack them on top of each other to create that one solid crosshair. Now, after you've loosened your locking screw slightly, you are then going to evaluate the position of the out of place crosshairs. You are then going to find the adjustment point that is opposite of those out of place crosshairs. You will then adjust your adjusting screw, snug up your, all the locking screws around the lens cell, go back to your Cheshire eyepiece and evaluate your collimation. If it's still out of place, you'll go back to the front of the lens cell, you'll loosen up those locking screws, do your adjustment on your adjusting screw and go back to the Cheshire and repeat the process as necessary. And don't forget to lock it. That will ensure that your collimation will stay in place after it's been achieved. Thanks for watching guys. That is exactly how you collimate a refractor telescope. So if you run into any problems or have any questions, go ahead and call our 800 number or reach out to our customer service through email and they'll be able to help you with any of your needs.